Oh, there we go, on air. Good morning, science, science group and working group members. Could we please take our seats at the table? We have some new members today, and if you're one of the new members, there is a name tag up here or an agency tag for you at the table. Let's go ahead and call this meeting to start. Thank you very much. By way of introductions, I'm James Erskine, Everglades Coordinator with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and Chairman of the Working Group. Normally I get right to business, but I'd like to just take this opportunity today to thank everybody, everybody at the table here, for their hard work, their agencies, their staff back at the office, because it's certainly not something the folks at the table here do single-handedly. There has been great momentum. There's been great progress in the areas, in many areas, including water management, operations, wildlife management, communication. Those things are really helping us out as we move forward. We have a great agenda, has a lot of information on it, but it is a condensed agenda today. We're going to wrap up fairly sharply at 11.45 today to make room for the afternoon session, which is a task force sponsored, excuse me, task force sponsored workshop on the IDS schedule. So with that, I'd like to just go through some of the particulars and some of the housekeeping of the meeting today. Today, everything is being webcast. So please use your mics. One push turns the mic on. In addition to that, um, in addition to that, we will have one public comment period for our public that is engaged today. So if you'd like to have, uh, if you'd like to do that, please file a card with our folks at the Office of Ecosystem Restoration Initiatives to get on the schedule for the public comment. And anyone who would like to public comment on the IDS schedule would like to ask that you have those comments and reserve those comments for the workshop in this afternoon. But we'll go ahead and we'll touch base on that later in the day as well. From here, I'd like to pass the mic to Adam Gelber to do some further introductions. Thank you, James. Uh, just some opening remarks here this morning. Um, we have a lot on the agenda today, a lot of topics. Um, I, you know, I, we all probably attend a lot of meetings around, but this is one of the unique ones where we're all sitting down at the table this morning. And the importance of the working group and the science coordination group um, in, in matching policy and science and how we work through these matters is ultimately critical about how we have that vertical conversation up to our, each of our task force members. Um, that may or may not be here present today. And um, just, we have a lot of work ahead of us, and, and I know James has got a, a tight uh, schedule today to meet, so I'll conclude with that, and, and I thank you all for your participation. Uh, we have a lot of work to do ahead of us in the next year. Thank you. Before we go down and introduce our, introduce our co-chairs at the table, I'd like to welcome a few working group members that are new. Jennifer Leeds with the South Florida Water Management District. We have Kevin Kunith from the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I don't believe is Kevin at the table yet. Okay. And Sonny Snyder from NOAA. Okay. Thank you. And from here, I'd like to introduce our vice chairs and, and co-chairs, excuse me. Thank you, James. Susan Gray with the South Florida Water Management District and chair of the uh, Science Coordination Group. Nick Allman, U.S. Geological Survey and Vice Chair of the Working Group. Uh, 
Uh, I'd also like to welcome some new members to the Science Coordination Group. Um, interestingly, I know all these people. <laughs> I don't know what that means. It means I've been here a long time, I think. But I, I'm really glad to see some of these folks cycle back into this process because we need the continuity and we need their knowledge on the system. So uh, Stacy Myers, uh, representing the Seminole Tribe. Stephanie Romanock, representing USGS. And Angie Dunn with the Corps of Engineers. So welcome. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Susan. Yes, welcome, new members. In your packets that were sent out in the read-aheads were the minutes for the June 2019 meeting. Um, I think we'll go ahead and we'll defer. We'll go ahead and we'll defer a motion on the minutes until um, late. I was going to say until after lunch, which is our normal procedure. But we'll hold on that. We'll give everybody a few minutes if they'd like to look over those minutes, if they haven't pre-read them, and we'll entertain a motion when it's ready. Mm -hmm. From here, I'd like to do, we'll go ahead and do a whip around on the table. And I'll start over here with our new member of the working group, Jennifer Leeds, just to do introductions of all of our members. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Jennifer Leeds, um, I'm serving as the interim division director for the Everglades Policy and Coordination Group. Um, very excited to be here this morning. This is my first working group as a working group member representing the district. Um, and it's an exciting time, both the CERP program and the ecosystem restoration um, program uh, has seen a lot of momentum these past few years, uh, and we're capitalizing on that. Um, we've also seen a lot of support coming from Governor DeSantis in his uh, funding in the FY20 funding, over $400 million for Everglades restoration, and then last week he dedicated um, and committed $300 million of recurring funds um, at a minimum for Everglades restoration. So a really exciting time, and uh, just looking forward to uh, capitalizing on the progress. So thank you. Hi, Angela Dunn. Uh, I'm the Environmental Branch Chief with the Corps of Engineers, Jacksonville District, and this is my second Science Coordination Group meeting, but I'm looking forward to helping continue to push the science and restoration that we're doing in the Everglades. Hi, good morning. Ed Smith with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm the Director for the Office of Ecosystem Projects, and I'd just like to echo uh, Jennifer's uh, words about the commitment from the state, you know, over $400 million in this current budget, and then the, the governor's announcement last week that seeking to dedicate recurring $300 million. It's a pretty exciting time in Everglades restoration. I know my staff is uh, always on pins and needles when those numbers come out of how do we meet those expectations, but they're up, they're up for the challenge. So, Good morning. I'm James Evans. I'm the Director of Natural Resources for the City of Sanibel. I'd concur with Ed's comments. Uh, we certainly uh, appreciate the support of the governor. Um, I'd also like to take this time to thank the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for maximizing your operational flexibility this year to reduce the um, discharges to the estuaries, specifically this summer. It's helped a lot. Um, we've seen uh, significantly better uh, conditions throughout uh, the estuaries. And uh, while Sanibel right now is experiencing some red drift algae washing up on our beaches, which has kind of plagued our uh, economy over the last month, um, the conditions this year have been drastically improved compared to last year. So we really appreciate that, and uh, we look forward to working with everybody. Good morning, everybody. Pedro Ramos, uh, Superintendent for Everglades and Dry Tortugas National Parks. Good to be here, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's great to hear you kick off this meeting with such optimism. We do have a lot of great momentum going on, and we need to keep it going. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Brian Benscoder, uh, Associate Professor at Florida Atlantic University uh, here in, for uh, John Baldwin, uh, who couldn't make it uh, on the Science Coordination Group. <clears throat> good morning. Lee Hefty with Miami-Dade County's Division of Environmental Resources Management. And I just want to emphasize the, the importance and value of having a multi-tiered cooperative group, both federal, state, and local government. I think it really shows the importance of uh, Everglades uh, to the state, the county, and the country. Thank you. Good morning. This is John Mayle with the Ecosystem Division for Martin County. And I would echo some of the previous uh, positive comments about what a great year we've had in terms of uh, funding, policy, and water management. 
And uh, additionally, I'd like to specifically point out um, our gratitude to the state and the Department of Environmental Protection for some recent grant awards to deal with some local watershed issues. Good morning. I'm Russ Morgan, uh, state conservationist with USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And it's good to be back. I think I missed the June meeting, but I'd just like to announce that uh, USDA does have a, a member of the task force now. On the Secretary Bill Northey uh, will be representing USDA on the task force. And also Jason Strent, the state conservation engineer with NRCS here in Florida, will be a part of the uh, science coordination group. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dave Rudnick, uh, science coordinator at Everglades National Park and special advisor to the Department of Interior. Hi, everybody. I'm Larry Williams with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Wow, let me get that microphone right. I guess I shouldn't get so close to it. Um, but I, I, I'll just kind of go out on a limb and say we're kind of like riding a cloud right now because when we look at the water volumes that are going from Conservation Area 3A into Northeast Shark River Slough, it's a huge milestone. Uh, we were reviewing that yesterday with the core, and um, I think this year we're looking at 338,000 acre feet that have already flowed uh, from 3A into Northeast Shark River Slough, and before the year's over, it'll be probably 500,000 acre feet, and that's like double or triple what it's been before, and um, all the work that we've done to get the uh, additional bridges built to get the higher water levels in the L29 canal is like starting to pay off in a huge way. So we were just looking at those numbers yesterday with the Corps and they're just hugely impressive numbers. And it's drying out the, the nesting habitat for Cape Sable sparrows. So uh, like I said, we kind of feel like we're riding a cloud right now. You know, we're reaching some of the milestones we'd worked for for a long time. So uh, feels really good. Yep, thank you. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Romaniak. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey, and being new to the SCG, I'll just give you a little bit of background about who I am. So I am a research ec ecologist with the Wetland and Aquatic Research Center, and I run a small team that does conservation and restoration planning, and we do a lot of that through quantitative means, a lot of predictive ecological modeling. And uh, one of our primary areas of focus is uh, Everglades restoration planning. And so I do a lot of the ecological modeling to look at what are potential impacts of, on species or habitats that we care about to help select among alternative restoration plans. And I, I look forward to, to starting with you all today. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Roland Adelini. I'm director of Lee County's Division of Natural Resources. As uh, Jane mentioned, we're also very appreciative of the flexibility that the Corps afforded in, in release schedule from Lake Okeechobee. And, and we are fortunate also the weather was in our favor this, this past summer as well. So um, the conditions out there are pretty good. Um, in, interesting agenda. Uh, we're anxious to see all the different elements that are going on in South Florida because we recognize getting flow, the flows and the quantity right will also help our water quality issues in the Caloosahatchee. As a local government, we continue to do our projects in addressing um, over nutrification of our waterways. We've also been a recipient of some recent money from DEP on some local projects, so we're very appreciative of them as well. So uh, looking forward to working with you today. Good morning. Apologies for being late. My name is Kevin Kniff. I am the Director of Environmental Resource Management for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Jeremy McBrien sitting in for Deborah Drum, Palm Beach County, um, the County Water Resources Manager. Uh, Deb couldn't be here. She's at the beach today. I'm sorry, beach conference. Um, uh, thanks for letting me, let me sit, sit in. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm Stacy Myers. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, uh, I'm the assistant director with the Seminole Tribe of Florida's Environmental Resource Management Department. Um, the tribe is uh, has uh, 
wanted to take a more active role in, in uh, these types of meetings, uh, mainly because a lot of these projects are starting to directly affect them, particularly Lake Okeechobee Watershed Project and some of the other other projects within this region. So uh, I think uh, you'll see more of an active role with the Seminole Tribe of Florida in these, these types of meetings. And I look forward to working with everyone. Good, good morning. I'm Bob Pergulski. I'm the Everglades Program Supervisor for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and a member of the Science Coordination Group. Rebecca Elliott, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and their Water Policy and Planning Group. And I'm on Recover for SERP, and I am the department's team member for a lot of these restoration projects and for things like the Combined Operational Plan. A lot is happening. A lot is finally getting to completion. And I'm really looking forward to this agenda and all the good work that went into it. Thank you. Okay, Cecilia Harper, EPA, SERP liaison to the Corps. I am co-located with the Corps in Jacksonville, and I sit on many of the um, restoration teams as well as recover, um, and I also work 404 regulatory. I'm looking forward to the updates today. Good morning. Chad Kennedy with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and I'm the representative for the Science Coordination Group. I did want to mention it. Uh, it's kind of funny as things go by, as Susan mentioned earlier, about being around for a while. I remember when Dan Thayer first brought out uh, a snakeskin of pythons and said that the water management, this has been years ago, first kind of was the genesis of an effort to deal with the pythons, at least recognize and raise awareness of that. And then, and I was like, honestly, I was like, come on. You know, how bad could these things be? And now we have the governor of the state has gotten very serious about pythons. It's, so it does matter what happens in this room. It may take a while, but things do get move. And uh, it's just kind of, it's making me more optimistic than I already was about the future. And things are just going so well right now. I'm, I'm scared to jinx it. But anyway, uh, I hope we have a great meeting. It looks like a very robust agenda. Good morning, Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Reynolds with the Corps of Engineers. And I have the honor to introduce my replacement, who's here with us today. So um, Todd Polk, and I'll give him the mic in just a second so he can tell you a little bit about himself. Um, but we're just really excited to be here. So we have um, all of our A-team here um, to support this agenda. And we're really looking forward to a lot of exciting conversation uh, today about all of the activities that are going on. You know, right now we really have fantastic alignment um, and Mother Nature is cooperating with us, um, which is a huge part of it. And so we appreciate all the accolades, but we really can't take too much credit. Um, we've had a lot of luck this year um, to be postured, to be in a really great place, um, both in terms of the water levels, the weather, the amount of projects that are functioning and the perspective looking forward in terms of the funding that we're getting at both the state and federal levels as well as the local participation. So this is just a great time and it's great to be part of this. I'll turn it over Thank to you. Todd. Hi, uh, good morning, Todd Polk uh, with Corps of Engineers and, and she's way too modest. I, no one's replacing her. I'm succeeding her in the uh, position only and, and couldn't be more excited. Uh, my family and I have uh, we feel like we're, we're ready to put down roots down here in South Florida. And I've had, as everyone asks how things are going, I said, you know, this past six weeks have been the best uh, science field trip I've taken. And, and I just I really appreciate uh, everyone's welcoming. I, I think every every agency I've met here has been phenomenal and just helped help me teach. And I, I or helped teach me. And it's just been an amazing uh, privilege. And I'm uh, looking forward to continuing for the next several years. I'm Bob Johnson uh, with the National Park Service. I'm the vice chair of the Science Coordination Group, and I'm glad to be out of traffic. <laughs> so uh, I will start there. <laughs> and we've got a bunch of, uh, I think, key science efforts that we're pushing this year and really trying to integrate them into the decision-making process, uh, whether it's uh, the invasive exotic species or whether it's indicators to figure out how to describe the benefits as we go forward better. I just think this is a great time in terms of our efforts to integrate science and management 
uh, and money certainly helped, but uh, I don't want to draw the line there, so thank you. I know I already introduced myself out of turn, so I won't do that again. But I would like to make a few quick comments. One is in, on just a general comment about USGS and the Python work. I was really excited to see what the state's doing, uh, bumping up efforts on uh, Burmese Python. That's really exciting. I think, you know, we need to be all hands on deck to try to solve that problem. And just, you know, something we've been working on for a long time, and we look forward to collaborating more with uh, all entities working on invasive species work, especially the Python. And in the, it sort of made me think about what we're putting into as an agency into Python research. I added it up uh, last week, and it's about one, a little over one and a half million dollars a year just on Python research related to all sorts of aspects, uh, mostly done by Bob Reed out of, and his group out of uh, Colorado, uh, and then locally Kristen Hart, uh, a lot of folks here locally working on the Python issue. So it's, it's really a good time, uh, and I'm going to be trying to ramp up our efforts to work more closely with with folks so that we're making sure we're not overlapping and, in fact, that we're leveraging our dollars to get a lot more distance out of them. I also want to take the opportunity to embarrass Stephanie a little bit um, just because she didn't say anything. But uh, just so you know Stephanie a little better, she's been around, most of you know her, she's been around a while. And she is, uh, you know, she works on ecological issues and Picayune Strand, on wildlife indicators of restoration success, but probably spends most of her time with the Joint Ecological Modeling Team of USGS and works with uh, her partner in crime uh, over uh, in Craig Konzelman over in uh, La Lafayette, Louisiana. But they spend an incredible amount of time developing custom tools for managers to use in various aspects. And so uh, that's really, uh, you know, I think it's an important thing for us to work hard to make sure the science that's produced is then easily applied and used in effective ways. And I think that whole group uh, you know, every time I've gone to them and said, wouldn't it be cool if we had this tool that did, and then, you know, in a couple of weeks there's a tool. Um, and so it's, it's, I'm really excited about having Stephanie around. And a lot of you may not know that she has a, a the other side of her professional life is mostly on the African continent. And she works, she's one of the Department of Interior's main experts on wildlife track, illegal wildlife traffic in the African continent, especially with large animals, cats. So... She probably may be a side you didn't know you should ask her. If you've seen her office, you'll understand. I think we have a few more introductions on this side of the room. Good morning. Uh, Jennifer Hecker. I'm representing the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership, formerly the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program. We're one of 28 national estuary programs in the United States. We cover um, the western side of the Everglades, our uh, expansion area that we just added into our service area covers the freshwater Caloosahatchee, so we're now up to about 10 counties in central and southwest Florida that we're working to protect water and wildlife in. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Penny Hall. I'm here representing Gil McRae at the Fish and Wildlife um, Conservation Commission. And I run the seagrass monitoring program for Florida Bay in Southwest Florida for Recover. Thank you very much, team members. From here, I'd also like to acknowledge we've been joined in the audience by Patty Powers, Seminole Tribe of Indians of Florida, um, Task Force Representative. Good morning, Patty. Hmm? Good morning, Veronica Harold James with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami. Thank you. Thank you. Did you? Um, no, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. All right, and from here we'll go on to a uh, uh, leadership discussion for the Science Coordination Group. Susan. Uh, thank you, James. Just so to let you know that my plans are to retire at the beginning of the year next year. And so Disapproved. what? Disapproved. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a big Sorry. grin? No. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit mixed emotions because I know all of you, and I've known all of you for a long time, and I love working with all of you, but so um, I will miss that. I may not miss all the meetings, but I will miss the people. But regardless of that, uh, what I am proposing is to step back from the chair position and flip-flop 
with Bob Johnson so that he would take over as the chair. Uh, and for a couple reasons, I wanted to do it now. One, there's a task force meeting in October, and the task force will need to approve what we all adopt. So they will be the final uh, word on that arrangement. So uh, at this time, I'm just looking to the SCG to see if there are any uh, comments or questions or uh, yays or nays on whether you're okay with that proposal. Uh, Susan, one, uh, just one comment. I think it's whoever is selected, I think it's good to have a balance of if it's a federal person is a vice chair or chair, I think the other person should be a non-fed and, you know, so right. the group should be kind of mixed or, or one of the county folks. So that, that's my only ask is that we not have kind of the same family represented for at, on both the chair and vice chair positions. Yeah. That, and that's been how it's been structured right. and we'll maintain that structure. So Adam? So, may I? Susan, uh, congratulations. Thanks. But I, I do second that motion to uh, uh, deny your retirement. <laughs> uh, I know that it's not going to go anywhere, so uh, we're happy for you. Uh, that said, and, you know, depending on how things uh, end up uh, shaking out, uh, I would support Mr. Johnson getting involved in whichever way uh, this board and the task force wants him to, as long as that is not a position from where people typically retire from. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to make that uh, a requirement of any involvement from Mr. Johnson. Just saying. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your service. Um, eventually it will be greatly missed. Um, so I'd also like to point out to the group here that um, we encourage any SCG member, tribal, state, to uh, notify Kevin Berger or anybody at the OERI um, if you'd like to be considered for the SCG position. So um, if you don't have uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin's in the back over there, or myself, uh, just reach out to us uh, through this process, okay? Okay, so I'm looking for a, a motion and a second from the SCG members. Jed, motion? I'd be glad to make that motion. Thank you. Second. Nick, second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. The, the one thing I forgot to do is that when I retire, the Water Management District has proposed to pace uh, Lawrence Glenn on the science coordination group, so he'll be stepping into the district's position on this on this group. So just to let you know, you will be in very good hands. So thank you all. Thank you, Susan. From here, we have a priorities update and the status update on the working group and science coordination group priorities that were presented during the June 2019 meeting. Uh, on that, I know a lot of work has been done in the background. I've been tracking this and preparing for the meeting, so we'll hear an update from that. Adam, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, we had to share some mics because they're charging them for the afternoon, so bear with us on that during this early session. Regarding the task, uh, the, the task force directed priorities, this is our deliverable to them to support that conversation and decision-making process at the task force meeting. Um, most, of, most of you all and others not at this table are involved in these important topics. And that when we, you are engaged, yes, looking at the current, current trends, current information, current data is always super um, important, but also trying to you know, force ourselves to look at that future condition potentially and, and envision a future with scenario. Um, and that, uh, again, this is our deliverable, and uh, these will be the tools that you all develop in order to make the appropriate decisions to resolve forward progress on Everglades restoration. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Alan. Thank you, Alan, for your leadership. Oh, and one other thing, while you all are working on this, whether you're new to the, the, these priorities, um, the OERI team is there working with you at all times to facilitate, to organize, to help out with reporting, uh, basically helping out with the deliverable, while you all are very focused on a lot of other work besides just this. And we recognize that clearly. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our new working group and SCG members. I'm going to be going over some of the priorities that we established in June. If any of the new members or any of the current members wants to get up to speed on some of those other issues that I won't be briefing on today, please let me know. I'll be glad to sit with you and get you um, 
aware of all the other things that are your working group and SCG are going to be working on the following year. For this update, oops, sorry, got a little bit of a lag going on here. There we go. No. Ah, got it. Um, so we have a, a set of six priorities that we brought forward in June. Today I'm going to be updating you on two of those that are more of the longer term, more intense efforts, the system-wide ecological indicators and the invasive exotic species. As we continue working, our next um, update will be provided to the task force at their October meeting in D.C. And starting with the indicators. The task force has established this suite of system-wide ecological indicators to give a picture of e overall ecosystem health and how things are looking. These are the current indicators that we've been reporting on for many years now. We provide uh, an update as a standalone report as well as a portion in our biennial report that goes to Congress and the legislature and other interested parties. So we wanted to, at this point, take a look at these indicators and to see if we are reporting on the right things or do we have the right information? Do we need to change these at all? Are there um, challenges with some of the monitoring on some of them? Do we need just to refresh these indicators? So it was decided that yes, we need to take a look at that and we're developing a process to get there. But before we tackle the very technical information on the indicators themselves, we want to make sure that we have a good input from policymakers how the decision makers are utilizing this information. Are we giving them the correct information? So we want to take a look and see if we can make sure that it's being a useful document. We want to make it as useful as possible. So before we tackle the technical pieces, we're going to get to that policy level view of the document, of the indicators, and make sure that on the reporting level we're being as effective as possible. So what we're working on is we're going to conduct some one-on-one -on -one interviews with policy folks. We'll be contacting members of, of the working group and SCG asking you for the correct person that we need to talk to within your organization. It might be yourself. It might be the person you report to. How are these documents being used in Congress, in the legislature, when we're talking about Everglades restoration and how we are collectively doing and how the projects are collectively doing? So before we get started on the technical pieces, we'll get there. <laughs> this is going to be a long-term process, so we want to make sure we have the, an idea of the utility of the documents first. So that's what we will be doing. And so as I said, staff will be reaching out. I'll be working very closely with Laura Brandt, who has been luckily very willing to dive in and help us with this effort and we are not looking to get this resolved for our next biennial report that would be next year in 2020 we recognize that to do this correctly and to get the information we need it will feed into the subsequent biennial report but we are going to be constantly working on this so that's where we are with the indicators do i have any questions on that piece of the process before i go on to invasive species Everyone's good. Awesome. Then I'll expect you to answer your phone when we call you for those contacts. <laughs> perfect. 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 And another document that we had developed, we began work on it in 2013. We developed an invasive exotic species framework based upon the um, invasion curve and those four phases. That's how we have the goals of the document lined out. And we also have case studies for each part. We have action items that we identified and also looking at a cross-cut budget. Those were dated in 2015 and we're looking to update that to reflect a lot of the good work that's been happening since that time. As um, Chad said, invasive species, there's a lot more action happening now just even in the past few years to report on. So we're going to be taking a look at all those pieces. We already had a call with some of your staff working on this idea and we ran it through them. We're going to be gathering all the experts together and having um, discussions on how we can tackle that core document and the case studies. That's where we'll be starting. The more details will follow after that. So we're going to be having another update for everyone at the October task force meeting, letting everyone know where we've gotten with it. And our goal, though, with this process is to feed it into the 2020 reporting. So this one's on a little bit of a faster track, but because we have a good recent document, we're not looking at tearing it all apart. We're looking at updating it in smart ways to make sure we're reflecting all the good work all the agencies are doing on invasive exotic species and highlighting new concerns. 
So those are the two items I'm reporting on today. Any questions on that? Pedro. I do. Uh, so one of them is a comment, and you may be aware of this already. Uh, the state uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, with funding from uh, the Park Service uh, and other funding that they've received, are in the process of developing a statewide uh, I forget what they're calling it, uh, James. Do you do you know what I'm talking about? The uh, the statewide strategic action plan mm -hmm. on invas invasive species, and uh, so you know whatever we do, uh, just a comment that we don't duplicate. Correct. Uh, the work there, and that you know we fold it together uh, if at all possible, uh, as a suggestion, and then. The, the other thing that, uh, that I wanted to ask, and I can't remember whether in that 2013 work that we did, uh, it was focused on animals. Uh, is this something that includes animals and plants? Yes, it does. It includes both. We looked at it. A lot of the focus in our 2015 effort actually did highlight the fact that we needed to get the funding and resources up to par with where we had been with invasive plants. When we did the cross-cut budget, we saw that it was really skewed towards the weed, so a lot of our effort was to say, hey, let's bump up and prioritize, especially the EDRR, the Early Detection Rapid Response efforts on animals. That was a focus, but the other parts are in there as well. That was just a highlight of urgency at that time, saying, what are we missing? We need to fill this gap and move together more quickly on things together. So it's in there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'll make a comment about uh, the, the work that USGS is doing. And, and Nick, you mentioned a little while ago about the funding that uh, your shop is bringing to the table uh, on pythons and other stuff. And I want to tell you, uh, yesterday uh, I was at the park uh, listening to three presentations at Bob Johnson's office, and that uh, one of them was on weeds, and the two others were on snakes. And in comes about 11 or 13 people uh, from USGS. Uh, they totally looked like the Python Strike Force team uh, that were here, here to, uh, to take care of business. And uh, I understand that you and others are funding them being here down uh, at the park uh, with us for some time uh, doing research. Uh, I really commend the governor and everybody else that uh, is working on these removal efforts that have been ramped up. Uh, it's important to keep up that heat, but we all know that science is what's going to give us the best bang for our buck uh, in the long term. And, uh, the, the research and the studies, the experiments that uh, they're already been doing uh, since they got down here to the park have been really interesting. So uh, thank you for, uh, for that support, Nick. Hey, do I just like to capitalize on what you just said and just let you know and for FWC, we do have strategic members involved on both of those actions, the interagency python coordinator and our non-native wildlife coordinator. So to prevent the overlap, make sure these state level documents and the level documents that are being produced from this organization here, this group, support each other appropriately. Thank you. Good comments. Any other questions? And again, we have some other priori priorities we'll be working on. Some of those are communication tools. So if you have any questions about the suite of priorities that we're going to be moving forward with over the next while, please contact me. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Alan. Good update. We'd like to move to agenda item number four with Bob Johnson, update on the Tamiami Trail Next Steps and Combined Operations Plan. Okay, uh, so in my day job, I'm a supervisory hydrologist and the director of the South Florida Natural Resources Center, and I just want to thank all my staff who worked until, <laughs> I was getting slides at 6.15 this morning as an update. So this is the newest information based on some of the flow measurements from the USGS that sort of just came out. So at least I want to say we're on it. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the Tamiami Trail next steps and 
mostly how it was designed at the same time as the Central Everglades Planning Project started up. So these are two projects that are integrated from the beginning, and I'm gonna show you some of the benefits of the projects as we move forward. But this is just kind of the reminder slide of the goals of the Central Everglades Planning Project, sending more water south, reducing harmful discharges to the estuaries, restoring some of the historic freshwater flows. This is all based on increasing the conveyance capacity of water from north to south across Tamium Trail. Tamium Trail has been an obstruction to flow since the 1920s, and we've spent uh, the last maybe eight years uh, on various phases of construction on Tamium Trail trying to raise and bridge this roadway to remove this flow obstruction. So our, the requirement for uh, the SERP and the Central Everglades project is we have to bring the canal stage up to accommodate a design high water of 9.7 feet. That's way up into the uh, sub base of the road, almost into the uh, structure course of the asphalt. And so that's why we have to raise the road. It would undermine the integrity of the roadway if we raise the water level when we don't fix the road. And so we got authority in 2009 by Congress to do the Tamium Trail Next Steps project. The phase one project was focused on uh, bridging on the western side. That's the yellow line on the graphic there. So 2.3 miles of bridging on the western side to complement the one mile of bridge that was built under the Modified Water Deliveries Authority by the Army Corps of Engineers. And now we're starting up the Tamian Trail Next Steps Phase 2. That is to raise the remaining portions of the roadway so we can bring up the road without adversely affecting the uh, design requirements. <coughs> okay. Yep. So first, kind of where does the design high water come from so you get an idea of where that is. So this is a curve. It's got a bunch of different lines on it. Focus on the blue line. So if you look at the SERP project and the, the design high water that's required to pass the volumes of water from north to south across Tam Amy Trail, this is a uh, exceedance curve. So on the, uh, the stage is on the y-axis, uh, and what you see on the bottom is return period. So at the far left is the driest years. You take the 41 years of the simulation, you take the annual maximum. That's what all the dots are. And so the driest years are on the left, the wettest years are on the right. So if you just look at the water levels prior to the modified water deliveries project, with the stage constraint we had originally at 7.5 feet, that translates to a one in 20 year drought. <laughs> so it means in almost any condition where it just slightly gets wet, Tammy material was a constraint. It could not pass the flow. You could still pass water, but you had to do it in the dry season when water levels weren't high. You couldn't pass it in the wet season. So then we go up to uh, follow the line into the, the one and two year uh, event, which is an average year event. Now with the modified water deliveries features in place, we can bring the canal stage up to 8.5 feet. That's the equivalent of a one and two year 50% event. So an average year we can pass the flow, but essentially anything wetter than an average year, the road is still a constraint, post-mod water, okay? So finally, with uh, achieving the SERP levels, we have to be able to bring the canal stage up to 9.7 feet. That's kind of the maximum we see in the modeling. It's about a one in 20 year flood. It's not the wettest, wettest year on record, but it's kind of design criteria for highways. And so in, to, in order to accommodate a 9.7 foot design high water, we have to raise the trail first from the stage of about 9.7 to 10.5. That was the lift created by the Modified Water Deliveries Project, partial raising but not replacing the sub-base, and now the next raising takes it to 13.1. Now we have the freeboard between the peak water level and the top of the road so that when the sub-base gets saturated, it doesn't cause structural harm to the roadway. So that's what we're doing. The National Park Service is working on a transportation project. Okay, so this is what the Tammy Trail Next Steps Phase Two project looks like. So if you look at the map, the legend in the bottom, you can see on the purple on the eastern side is the one mile eastern bridge built under the Modified Water Deliveries Authority. The orange are the approaches that had to be raised to harmonize the road and the bridge together. On the left is the 2.3 miles of bridges built under the Tammy Trail Next Steps Phase One project. Uh, uh, and then again, there's approaches associated with it. All the green on the map are the portions of the road that need to be raised to accommodate higher water levels. So it comes out to about six and a half miles of roadway that has to be raised to accommodate higher water levels. As we're raising the road, we wanna look at 
how we can increase the distribution of flow and particularly get it back into some of the historic sloughs that were there when the road was built in the 1920s. So we're adding six more large culverts slash bridges in that eastern reach between the existing bridges just to get the water back into those historic flows and to try to see if we can increase the flows at the, those locations to restore the slough environment. And like the decomp physical model, if you've been out there, it's going to take manipulation of the vegetation community to really get it going, but at least we can put the water in the right place and then we can start working from there. So the bottom there, three lines, it kind of explains where we are. We're raising six and a half miles of the road. We're putting in six of these larger culverts slash conspans. So look at the small inset on the top there. That's what they look like. They're prefabricated bridges, arches. Uh, we're roughly putting in six of those 12 feet wide. So it gives you an idea of uh, what they look like. They'll be at the same grade as the road. You won't notice them when you drive over, but they'll pass way more flow. At those locations now, there are three three-foot diameter culverts. And so it's a huge change in the conveyance at that location. The bottom line there gives you an idea of what the project for phase two is. The gross cost right now, based on our current estimates, is a million dollars. We got 43 and a half million from the state between FDOT and DEP. We got $60 million from the Federal Highway Administration. So we're moving forward with that project. Uh, the Park Service is doing all the permitting and the design up through construction drawings and the development of an RFP. And then we hand it over to the Department of Transportation. They let the, the project, they get the bids, they uh, send the contract out. That's the timeline for the construction award. We should be done with our design work by June of 2020. The award should be done by November of 2020. The construction is scheduled right now to be substantially complete by November 2022. And that's a very important date because it matches up when the next set of conveyance features for the Central Everglades project starts bringing more water south. So we're trying our best to not to create any problems with dependencies on any of the core projects. And so the timing is perfect. Just so you know what the problems are with the roadway, so this is the typical section for Tamiami Trail. That lower dashed green line is the existing roadway. So if you look at the water lines on the left-hand side, you can see the current design high water, 8.5 feet, creates a two-foot freeboard between the top of the pavement and the water level, but we're going to raise it up to 9.7, so we have to create more freeboard. So you see what we're doing. We're removing the structure course of the old road. We're adding new fill to make up the difference, putting the new structure course on. We have to widen the roadway prism in order to raise the road. You can't do it to the north because there's a canal. So all the widening of the prism has to occur to the south inside Everglades National Park. And then there's an addition by FDOT to widen the shoulders, replacing sod with pavement. So you could use it as an emergency lane during hurricanes which I think is a great idea. And there's an addition based on DEP's input to enlarge the swales. Uh, this diagram is actually wrong. The swales have to be wider than this initial uh, typical section. So the right of way that you see right now at the red line on the south side moves about 30 feet to the south. All right. So that's the part of the wetland system that we have to accommodate uh, this project. Uh, that's how we're moving forward. This came out of a value analysis workshop uh, back in uh, 2018. So just to get into a discussion about the flow changes on Northeast Shark Sliver Slough, what Larry and others were talking about in terms of the benefits of the project. So here's a plot of the total flow through Northeast Shark River Slough, the eastern flow path, the part that we're raising from 2003 through most current data through 2019. And so you can see that the discharges, these are monthly totals, so you, they're adding up to the annual total. So you can see there's been wet years along the way. Then you can see when the one mile bridge was completed uh, in 2013 and the road was raised 20, 2014. So we really didn't make an operational change under that uh, early part of modified water deliveries. We started making operational changes when the incremental field test started in October 2015. Right after that, we had the wettest dry season on record, uh, an El Nino, and the Corps did a deviation. And you can see what happens when you allow the canal stage to go to 8.5 feet. You can see the very high flows in response to the El Nino event. If you look at Hurricane Irma in 2017, you can see relatively low flows because we had so much water coming in and so much rainfall south of the trail that we exceeded the 
constraint on both tamiami material and in the eight and a half square mile area. So we had to stop inflows for a while. And then we got back to it in 2018 and 2019. But these are the highest flows on record that we have seen in Northeast Shark Slough ever. And 2019 is not exactly a wet year. And we're still passing record flows into uh, Northeast Shark River Slough. So we're absolutely seeing the benefits of uh, the roadway improvements and the commitment to send more water south as it's available through the water conservation areas and under Tamiami Trail. And I just want to show you a little bit about the flow distribution so you can get an idea of what happens when you add bridges. So uh, start with the eastern flow section. Um, let me just, just take it back just so I can show you where the breakdown of the, of the areas are. Sorry, I have to jump past these real quick. I forgot to point out the sections of the roadway. Come on. <laughs> Must be here. Whoop. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> so I broke up the roadway into three sections. The western section is from the control structure 333 over to the Airboat Association, then from the Airboat Association over to just past, uh, I think it's Cooperstown, or no, it's Everglades Safari Park, and then the eastern flow section. So the western flow section has a 2.3 mile set of bridges now. The eastern flow section has a one mile bridge in it, and the central flow section has the original culverts. And so what you can see, if I can get back to it, what you can see is what happens when you add bridges. So start on the eastern section. Uh, you can see the time periods pre-bridges is the lowest bar on the bottom. These are box and whisker plots. The box is defined by the center quartile from the 20th, 50, 25th, 25th percent to the 75th percentile, and the whiskers are at 90 and 10. So it gives you an idea of the range. So look at the, just the difference in the median. So in the eastern flow path, see how low the flows were prior to any bridging. And then the red bar is post one mile bridge. You can see the big bump that happens when you add the first one mile bridge. And you can see it's still higher because we keep adding more water. And because we turned the 356 pump station on, and now there's another contribution of flow of seepage return flow coming in. So there's a steady increase in flow in the eastern flow section. The central flow section is still going up, but the flow volumes are fairly low, you know, not huge. And then the western flow section is the kind of, I'd say, the big bump. Look what happened when we added the western bridges. That's the blue bars uh, when, the, in this case, it was before we made the design change. But uh, you can see how much the median went. It went from 50 CFS on average up to above 250 CFS. Okay, so bridges work. <laughs> that's the news here, bridges work. They pass water way more effectively than culverts. <laughs> so that's a good thing. <laughs> and then the last graph I have is kind of looking at how the trends are changing over time uh, in terms of flow into Northeast Shark Slough. And so if you look at the top left box, the natural system model, that's the volume of flow that we believe historically passed through the eastern flow section. The total flow into Shark Slough was about 2 million acre feet. The majority of that went into the eastern flow pass, almost 1.2 million acre feet. I won't say it's our target, but it's an idea of what the system we think looked like before we changed the, the deliveries. The current system is kind of the volumes are based on what we're doing with the incremental field tests right now. And a good year or an average year in that is about 260,000 uh, acre feet. The distribution of flow is still too much to the west, but the flow volumes you know, are coming up since where they were before the incremental testing. With modified water deliveries implemented, we double the flow crossing the eastern flow section from about 260,000 acre feet to 500,000 acre feet. We then have that same incremental benefit again in central Everglades. So we go from 500,000 acre feet to over 700,000 acre feet. These are huge numbers and they will mostly be coming from the Central Everglades Planning Project, which delivers water from Lake Okeechobee southward, primarily in the dry season, because that's when you have treatment capacity and the stormwater treatment areas in the EAA. And so this is going to lengthen the duration of flooding in the marsh in a very significant way. That's the biggest benefit we will have. That's what the small marsh fish really benefit from. Continuous water is important to fish. <laughs> And then it'll dry down and the wading birds will do really well. So the big bump is the continuation of flow throughout the year that we'll get. We'll see increases in water depths, but nothing as significant as the changes in water flow. So this is these are restoration benefits that are going to start in 2022, 2023. So, you know, for in restoration time, that's incredibly fast, you know. So and then all this stuff at the lower end is all supposed to be in by no later than 2027, kind of in our current plans, but it's a it's a cash-loaded 
uh, uh, process. So we're all making sure you know, we keep the funding going. But that's the benefit that we'll see from this project over time, and I will stop there. Nick, comment? It's Nick Almond. I just got a quick question, clarification question. Your diagram, don't worry, try to go back to it, but showed three con spans together, but yeah. it's just going to be one in each of six places, correct? It's going to be one set of con spans. So it'll be actually three of them. There will be six locations with three? what we priced out with six of those six by 12 foot openings. So roughly 72 feet across mm -hmm. at each of the six locations okay. Okay. versus nine feet across now. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jane, uh, Roland, rather. Yeah, curious how the system operates in a flood event, like a hundred-year event or something. Or is it? Uh, is there a large head differential across the ups, upside of the Tamiami Trail versus the south side? And is there a level of service that the road elevation set, or is it entirely controlled? flows upstream of that area? Well, I would say during high water events, water will still stack up in water conservation area 3A yeah. because we have a limited outflow capacity to the east. Uh, so it's very common for the S12 structures, downstream of the S12 structures on the western side, they reach 11 feet. That's a very common event. Mm -hmm. This is capped at 9.7. So we're not going to have the same volumes of water going to the east, but that's intentional because the east side is next to people. And we just can't raise the canal stage on the eastern side because of the risk of flooding. We also have a terrible time. We don't kind of show it here, but the volumes of water going in in both Mod Water and the Central Everglades project, we have the same volume or more leak out on the eastern side. So the big problem that limits us in wet periods is how to manage seepage. And that's a project we just have to keep working on. We're just, I would say, we're not quite there yet in terms of having an authorized project to deal with the seepage losses that cause an increased risk of flooding to the east and also reduce our restoration benefits. Chad? Well, Bob, first of all, I'd like to thank you for mentioning the, the swales and the stormwater treatment that we're going to enjoy now that we don't currently have on the road. So obviously the department loves water quality improvements, particularly next to the Everglades. Yeah, but the one thing I, I want to ask more on a personal note to you, we could talk about the numbers and all that type of thing. but. The Tamiami Trail, I guess the construction was started in about roughly 1915. So this basically a dam has been across this region for quite some time, longer than you and I have been around for sure, even probably combined <laughs> just a little bit. But uh, I wonder how it feels to be the hydrologist that's there on the watch. I know you were there prior to any of this thing that's going on to see this transition after 100, roughly 100 years, to see these flows coming back to the park. Well, I think everybody, for everybody, the inflows to Northeast Shark Slough were first blocked by the roadway, and then by, because we didn't do it well enough, a levy to the north with the L-29 levy. So since at least the 1960s, we've had virtually no surface water flow going into that basin until we got congressional authority to start doing experimental delivery. So it's been this progression of doing a little bit and doing a little bit more, and the combination of the mod waters and the Tamiami Mitchell next steps uh, creates the ability to, I would say, bring it. So now we're going to be all rest, all dressed up and waiting for restoration flows. So <laughs> that's a good thing. All right, Larry, and then we'll go to Ed. Yeah, Larry Williams with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And thanks, Bob, for, uh, you know, reporting all of this. And this is the progress I was talking about. I, I was just wondering, Bob, you know, one thing that's been especially important to us is how moving this water back to the east and back into the natural slough is getting it off of the Morro Prairie habitat. Do, do you have a slide or do you have the ability to kind of show the group where that is, you know, where subpopulation A of the sparrows are, that sort I of thing? I don't think Just I have a slide in this presentation, oh. but if you look at the, those blue areas versus the green areas on the eastern side of the park, that green area is pretty much the definition of where the Rocky Glades, Marl Prairies are on the eastern side. So if you think about it, the, look at uh, the, sec the fourth panel, the, the, ever the uh, SEP features. All the green stuff where the big arrow comes down through Northeast Shark, so all the green stuff to the west is pretty much higher elevated Marl Prairies. The same thing with the Rocky Glades on the eastern side. Yeah. So the blue arrow kind of follows the slough lower topography. 
Yeah. And so, okay. yeah, the goal is very much to try to get the flow in the slough and not going to the east. And I think the placement of the bridges is the critical part because right. having the additional bridges on the far west side reduces it coming back to the east, either onto the Marl Prairies or into developed areas. And then in central Everglades, there's a divide structure that's planned just to the east of the 2.3 miles of bridges so we can physically manage the western side higher than the eastern side. We can still bring stages up on the eastern side, but we can bring the western side up way higher. And so anything we can do to put the water further to the west is going to reduce impacts on the Marl Prairies and reduce impacts on the developed areas to the east. And something that, that I uh, heard yesterday in our conversation with the Corps of Engineers, I, I believe right now S12 A, B, C, and D are all open. And uh, you know all of the water volumes are going uh, to the east, which is where we want them. And the, the head differential from S12 A, which is typically the highest, and S12 D is like one inch. Mm. And we've never had that condition in the system. In the eight years that I've been in South Florida, we've never had that at this time of year. So that seemed like just another example of what a, what a really wonderful milestone this is. So uh, we're thankful. Yeah, so I would just point out that difference too. So when we only had the S12s and they were pushing all the water, that's kind of where the water went. Now yeah. with all the S12s yeah. open, we've been in zone A, maximum regulatory releases. We're passing about 900 CFS through the 2,500 CFS, uh, 2,500 feet of gate openings versus almost 1,300 CFS through about a 30 foot wide gate on the eastern side. So it just shows you the slough is over there. It's on the eastern side <laughs> and we just don't have capacity to put it in that area. And even with everything wide open, the western side just doesn't pass as much flow and it's because of topography. It's because of the Marl Prairie being higher on the western side. And so it's not an efficient place to put water for any reason. Bob, if, if I may, I need to get this thing away from me. Uh, great presentation. Uh, you know, this, this project uh, is as significant as they get. Uh, Tamiami Trail has been impeding water from going south now for many years, and uh, this last uh, Tamiami Trail next steps, phase two, is going to 100% complete all of the work that we have been envisioning that needs to be done in order to let the water flow. And uh, we, we speak a lot about the benefits of this project and others uh, from the terrestrial Everglades perspective, and I just want to remind all of us that the benefits uh, ultimately to Florida Bay are incredibly significant. Uh, you know, it's not only rehydrating the park and other areas that have been basically in, in permanent drought now for decades, uh, and, and also offering relief to the issues that we have all been facing and seeing uh, north of the Tamiami Trail, even north of where we're at today. But the reason why we embarked in this Everglades restoration effort was initially because of Florida Bay. And this is what's going to bring the water down to the bay to make it more resilient and prevent the kinds of events that we've seen over the past several years uh, with salinity and seagrass die-offs that have been massive affecting the fisheries and that ecosystem uh, down there that you know, played an important role in making Everglades National Park a world heritage site. It's one of the largest seagrass prairies in the world. So a huge, huge uh, horsepower that this project is going to allow us to have down here in our system. Yeah, Thank I think you. you're exactly right. My perspective is as restoration managers, our job is to identify constraints and then remove them. <laughs> this is the perfect example of that type of a project. That's how we should step forward. We should find out what's the most ne significant next constraint, how do we get it out of the way? And as you said, this is the constraint that opens up not only the northern end of the system, but the southern end of the system all the way down to Florida Bay. Let's go to Ed and um, unless something's burning, Ed will be the last comment on this item so we can move the agenda along. And I'll be real quick. I just wanted to say uh, 
Bob, first of all, thank you for the presentation, great presentation. But I think Bob also needs uh, a big thank you from this group because I don't, I don't people, pe think people understand what he has done to get this project moving. You know, he's, he's been available anytime I've called him for information, and that information was critical to getting this project into DOT's work plan. Their work plan process is typically 10, 15 years because Bob has you know, been driving this project and his staff, we were able to get them to ins insert it in one year, so to get it moving. And just to correct, the, the, all the 43 million was from DOT. D we didn't okay. have anything this time, so. All right. Thank you. Hey, Bob, Bob, one more, um, a couple more, sorry. I, I, uh, she said a hard stop, but uh, a couple of comments. <laughs> um, I couldn't override Adam. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, great project, right? Um, any, any sense of how contracting is going right now or the design at the Park Service, any issues there? Do you have any knowledge of that or is it just on, it's, it's moving? Well, our, our planning process, our design process started slow because mm -hmm. after the state committed three and a half million dollars for construction, and we were in the process of transferring it over, we weren't allowed to spend it on the design until we were guaranteed that we have the money to construct the project. And so you're not allowed to start designing a project that you can't pay for in the construction phase. And so we did not get, even though we submitted a, a grant application in December, we did not get approval for the funding until the end of May 2019. So then we did interagency value analysis meetings, and then we did the kickoff. We started the contract with the architectural engineering firm right at the end of July. And they are doing okay. everything they can to make this project go as fast as possible. Uh, so we're gonna have to probably add a lot more resources to get it done by an early design date. But the schedule I showed you is the schedule we're all committed to. So I think we're there. Uh, it, to me, it does not in any way impede where we're going with restoration. It, it meets the deadlines perfectly. So that's the best we can do, you know, is make sure we build stuff in time for the next project that wants to deliver the water. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's, uh, it is such a great project. I think with some of this, it's going to fight back and challenge some of those other aspects of Everglades restoration and, and within the park of peat loss and, you know, really trying to stay focused, though, on those solutions that are going to bring water to places like Garfield Bight, where there's so much evaporation during those low flow years. Um, and really, you know, it's these high flows. Yeah, there's going to be water, water everywhere. But when we hit those low water situations and how to manage that, that kind of a condition, to avoid those seagrass lot die-offs is, uh, you know, also needs to be part of the bookend of this. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Excellent presentation, a lot of detail and good information that we've, a lot of folks in this room have worked hard on for many years. Thank you for your efforts. I'd like to move on to agenda item number five, and I'd like to recognize Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds and Jennifer Leeds if they'd make some, like to make some introductory remarks for their respective agencies. So I'll just um, say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the funding levels at both the state and federal government are really exciting. Mm -hmm. And Howie really needs no introduction to this group. You all know him. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I had the same statements. Uh, I think what you'll see is that this budget reflects the commitment from both the governor and the state to moving Everglades restoration forward. Um, and Matt Morrison will, will go over that uh, for the district. Thank you. Thank you. I think Howie Gonzalez is up first. And I'd like to remind everybody at the table that your microphone's alive if they're green while the presentation's on. So any sidebar conversations do not get picked up on the webcast. Hmm. Great. Thank you. I'm um, Howie Gonzalez. I'm with the Corps of Engineers in Jacksonville, Florida. and. Chief of the Ecosystem Branch, uh, Program Manager for the Core South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program. And our presentation uh, about to go through is our FY20 federal budget. Uh, the discussions we've had in previous working group, science coordination group meetings, uh, have acknowledged that we had $200 million identified uh, in the President's budget for FY20, but I wasn't able to give the details. Uh, so between where we are, where we were in May when the notification first came out and in, in, into August, uh, there was some internal uh, USACE uh, all the way up to the administration and Office of Management budget to confirm that the plan that we had developed for the $200 million uh, was one that they could ultimately support, that we had the right authorizations, that the commitments that we were making with the $200 million would be supportable not only in, in FY20 uh, but going forward. So with that, 
we got the approval to release the plan. The plan's been out uh, on our Corps of Engineers website for a little over a month now, and I'll kind of take you through those details uh, here in a moment. Uh, it's understanding as I've given program presentations in the past, I talk a lot about the, the phases of a civil works project. And so we have our planning phase. Uh, I'll talk about some of those projects later on in today's agenda, which tends to be the, the cheaper uh, of our Corps of Engineers phases because we're doing studies. And in a smart planning arena, our studies are typically between three and five million dollars. From there, we move into detailed design, and, and that's a definitive investment decision that we make because once we start down a path of, of detailed design, that's going to ultimately lead to an investment decision to go to construction. And construction is where, where we have our, our big investments. So planning, design are, are all uh, maybe in the single digit millions of dollars. It's the construction projects that really get to how we're going to implement a $200 million plan. The challenge we've had over the last couple of years is that we haven't had the commitment in design dollars to get the designs ready, get the detailed plans and specifications on the shelf so we could go straight to construction. So what you'll see in a $200 million plan is, is a big push in design. So the goal is to get as much design as we can done so that if and when a significant funding amount comes in FY21, we have projects ready to construct. But at the same time, you'll, you'll see a significant portion going to construction because we understand that we have projects, some that have been authorized, um, you know, almost 10 years, uh, that need to be completed. This presentation will ultimately lead nicely into the integrated delivery schedule discussion uh, that we'll have next in our agenda. So you see a lay down, I uh, broke these up between non-SERP uh, comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, and then those under SERP. And you see how the, the top line totals get to our $200 million. So I'll go first into non-SERP, starting with the C-111 South Dade project. Uh, a very small amount of money to ultimately complete a post-authorization change report. The scope of this report is focusing mainly on the replacement of pump stations 332 B and C. Uh, that'll give us a congressional authorization that we're seeking in a word of 2020 to make those permanent, make those pump stations permanent uh, as compared to, to the facilities that we have out there now. For Kissimmee River restoration, the million dollars is to continue project oversight of ongoing construction contracts. Uh, we have some of our last construction contract efforts to be awarded uh, in the next couple of weeks before the end of fiscal year 19. Uh, and it'll also allow us to continue to work with the South Florida Water Management District on those lands, easements, rights of way, uh, the items that the South Florida Water Management District gets credit for in our cost share uh, partnership on this project. Uh, I know I fielded a question earlier this week with regards to why Kissimmee's number may be so low, uh, and, and it's tied to that point that the contracts that we've awarded, those funds are already obligated. So this million dollars is primarily for uh, in-house labor to support those ongoing construction efforts and oversight and ultimately work with South Florida Water Management District. As we get into SERP, uh, again, this is where the, the significant portion of the $200 million will be, uh, will be obligated, and, and I'll just kind of run down a list. For C-43 West Basin Storage Reservoir, uh, we've had about almost $2 million to continue our support of the South Florida Water Management District's construction. Uh, as we've briefed in previous working group, science coordination group meetings, the South Florida Water Management District has taken the lead and is constructing that C-43 project. Our oversight ensures that uh, we understand what's being constructed, that the construction is maintained in compliance with federal standards, and ultimately when the South Florida Water Management District seeks working kind credit for their construction, that that approval process runs pretty smoothly. You see the Indian River Lagoon South project, uh, $27.5 million. We're in the final couple of years of construction for the C-44 reservoir uh, on the Corps of Engineers side and understanding our support uh, for the South Florida Water Management District's construction of the stormwater treatment area and project pump station. You see significant uh, progress being made in designing the C-23-24 North and South reservoirs and stormwater treatment area. Again, one of those projects where our goal is to get those designs on a shelf so that if when FY21 funding becomes available, we can award some construction contracts and, and C2324. 
We're awarding a construction contract, uh, I'm sorry, we have awarded a construction contract on an intake canal for C44. So again, those pieces that are all coming together uh, for a C44 construction completion in the next couple of years. On to Picayune Strand Restoration Project, the $38 million is for a construction contract award on the Southwest Protection Features. Uh, this is one of the last elements as we've completed construction on the three project pump stations. Uh, we're doing all of the road removal and looking to actually plug some of the canals to advance restoration benefits in Picayune. So the Southwest Protection Features is our last big construction element uh, for Picayune, which will then allow us to really bring the restoration flows to those 55,000 acres. For Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, this is continuation of construction on the phase one portion of the project. Uh, we are planning to award contract four this fiscal year, and we intend to award contract five, which would be the last pieces of construction for Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Phase 1 uh, in FY20. For Broward County Water Preserve Areas, continuing the significant design effort on the C11 impoundment. And then the last portion, uh, the one you've probably all been waiting for, is the Central Everglades Planning Project and a nearly $71 million allocated for SEP. Uh, you see a long list of items that we're looking to tackle and continue on SEP in FY20, including detailed design on SEP South pieces parts, right? We saw Bob's slide, and there's a, a lot of components in SEP South uh, that we're going to work towards detailed design completion and construction contract award. That includes executing a project partnership agreement with the South Florida Water Management District to ensure that both work that they're doing right now is creditable and that we have the the project laid out on who's going to be constructing what pieces of SEP South going forward. You see efforts on SEP New Water. That's where the EAA reservoir component uh, resides. And you see the completion of the follow-up report uh, that was required out of WERDA 2018. And you also see design efforts and validation report efforts uh, on SEP New Water. So, you know, we'll continue to work with the South Florida Water, Water Management District to support their detailed design efforts uh, of SEP components, both SEP South and SEP New Water, uh, in addition to initiating uh, our own detailed design efforts in awarding construction contracts. SEP, uh, next up is Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Phase 2. This is uh, the next PIR that we have set to, to initiate in our program. Uh, we have three ongoing PIRs right now. Uh, I'll talk about two of those uh, here in a moment. Uh, but as we look at how we generate those projects working through the phases, uh, ultimately to have projects in the queue for planning is, is very important to continue to, to seek out and achieve the, the original restoration goals in CERP. And so Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Phase 2, uh, we intend to fully fund that effort. Right now we're working on the project management plan to confirm the scope. Uh, we do have the goal of staying within that $3 million in three years for both the cost and the schedule. Uh, so we feel at this point the $2.5 million federal uh, would go along with the approximately $500,000 from the, the South Florida Water Management District as our base estimate to get to that $3 million. And lastly is our SERP design and program management. This is for our program level activities, our program management actions. Uh, it also includes our science program for recover and adaptive assessment and monitoring. Uh, we typically spend on order of four to five million dollars per year for science uh, to include four million dollars plus uh, in monitoring and then our recover efforts to support all of the various science and reporting products that recover produces. So with that, that builds to the $200 million. Um, we're looking to minimize our carryover from FY19. Uh, our funds don't expire, so if we don't use them this year, they just roll into the next fiscal year. Uh, and so with a minimization of FY19 carryover, uh, we do expect to have that $200 million um, available uh, as soon as the budget's uh, enacted in FY20, and we'll be rolling into this plan uh, as, as soon as we can. And that concludes my briefing, pending any questions. Seeing no questions at the table, we'd like to move on to in, in, invite Matt Morrison for the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, 
Okay, good morning everybody. Matt Morrison with the South Florida Water Management District. I'm gonna provide a, a very brief update this morning on some of the South Florida Water Management District highlights for our upcoming fiscal year that starts October 1. And the numbers that you're going to see are really related to the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program and specific to the agreements that we have with the Army Corps of Engineers to improve the environment through our cost share program uh, with the federal government. Um, so I'm gonna put the bottom line right up front. As Jennifer indicated, we've had really strong support from our governor and our state legislators in providing us funding in this upcoming fiscal year. Our total South Florida ecosystem restoration budget at the Water Management District is $423.8 million. And I think I need to note that that doesn't include the 43 million that's coming from uh, for example, DOT for the road raising at uh, Old Tamiami Trail as part of the phase two project that Bob mentioned earlier. Uh, these numbers also do not include our restoration strategies program that receives $32 million a year to improve our ability to treat water as we uh, continue to try and move more water south to the natural system. And it also doesn't include money that's coming in through appropriations and ad valorem funding for our Northern Everglades and Estuary Protection Program. So with that said, when you look at the 423.8 million for this program and you look at the other state contributions, we're well in excess of a half a billion dollars in environmental restoration activities for our upcoming uh, fiscal year. Um, in addition to the uh, to that, uh, or I should say as a breakout of that, we've got about 415 and a half million uh, for the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. And then as project features are transferred from the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program to long-term operations and maintenance, there's obviously a cost to operate and maintain those facilities. And we have 8.3 million budgeted for those facilities that have been completed as part of the restoration program that we'll be operating in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, the details are there, just you know, some of those highlights um, of uh, the 423.8, 415.5 million are specific to the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Uh, the Central Everglades Planning Project, the Water Management District is moving out uh, quickly on implementing a number of those project components to the tune of about 169 million. They include uh, doing the early design work for the EAA stormwater treatment area that's part of the post authorization change report that was recently approved by Congress in 2018, as well as con conveyance improvements to both the Miami and North New River Canal. Um, this upcoming calendar year in the March timeframe, we will be letting a contract for the actual physical removal of old Tamiami Trail to open up the southern end of the system that will work in parallel with the construction activities that are ongoing right now for the S333 North structure that uh, once again will improve our ability to move water from Water Conservation Area 3A into Everglades National Park, opening up the southern end of the system as part of the Central Everglades planning project. Um, in addition to that, we recognize the importance of, of storage around the lake, north, south, east, and West, we have uh, strong funding for our continued construction of the C-43 Reservoir over on the Caloosahatchee River. And we were um, granted about $50 million for us to move forward and look at opportunities to implement storage north of the lake associated with the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project in advance of congressional authorization for that particular project. In that, we're looking at ASR technology and some of the studies that have been completed. Um, we're gonna be conducting a siting analysis this upcoming fiscal year, and we'll be looking at opportunities to revamp some of the ASR systems that were part of the CERT program pilot studies, as well as some other wells that have been out of service for a while. And then um, just planning and, and program some more support. That's a $43 million fund that uh, basically uh, supports the program in, in general, it includes salaries and wages, for example. And it also houses our funding uh, and our funding match for all of our current and future planning for the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. 
And then down there at the bottom, we're wrapping a few things up on IRL South, the pump station and uh, the STA over at the C44. Uh, there's $4 million earmarked for design activities associated with the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Phase 1 project. Um, we are moving forward in partnership with Miami-Dade County to do the design work to get the Cutler component uh, design and ultimately constructed. And then there's $1.4 million in our decomp physical model that's earmarked here as Water Conservation Area 3 decomp and sheet flow. That is the scientific studies that are ongoing regarding what we call the S-152 structure, where we're gaining knowledge and science-based information on moving water from Water Conservation Area 3A into 3B. And then last but not least, uh, in the CERT program, we have a $1.1 million line item for adaptive assessment and our, our monitoring program that also supports recover. Um, so that's really the, the set of major highlights for those that are really interested in the operations and maintenance aspects. I'm not going to run through them, but there's been a, a number of project features in the program that have been transferred to long-term operation as we move through planning, design, construction. Uh, some of which are still uh, forthcoming, but this is just a, a quick snapshot of the $8.3 million that we have budgeted to operate uh, the facilities that are, are part of uh, the SERP or part of the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Program. And with that, that's all I had and would be more than uh, available to answer any questions. Howie and Matt, thank you very much for the very informative presentations. There's a lot of detail in there and a lot of depth. But I would like to just comment that if you turn back the clock and look back just a few years, you're looking at $200 million, somewhere in the ballpark of $200 million investment in the restoration program. And what we just heard there was somewhere in the neighborhood of $700, $750, $750 million investment in the program coming up. So very, very significant progress and momentum with that. And thank you very much for putting it all together concisely. Uh, around the table, any questions before we move on? Okay. From here, we'd like to go to agenda item six, consultation on the integrated delivery schedule. And I'd like to remind all of our members here at the table and our folks in the audience that the Army Corps of Engineers had requested a that the task force sponsor a workshop on the IDS, and that workshop was unanimously approved at the re that unit. That workshop was unanimously approved by the task force members, and it's being held in this room today at one o'clock. With that, I'd like to welcome Eva Valles to the podium. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm excited to uh, step into my friend Kim Taplin's shoes for the Army Corps of Engineers and take over for her to talk about the integrated delivery schedule, but have no fear. She is right there next to me every <laughs> single day and uh, will be my lifeline uh, when I have to phone a friend and, and have a question that I can't answer. So, so with that, I wanna make sure that, that all of you have the handouts because this will be an interactive 20 minute discussion. So I wanna make sure you have three placemats with you. Uh, one is the 2018 July 2018 integrated delivery schedule as a look back. Uh, one is the SFER placemat, program placemat. Uh, that's the second one. And the third one is the working version of the 2019 IDS. So if everyone has those, we will be ready to get started. This is our agenda. Uh, we will go through the IDS purpose and a little bit of background only because there are some uh, new members today and also because it helps to get us all in the right frame of mind. The IDS is a pretty technical document. There's a lot on every single little square inch we could fit and I wanna make sure we're, uh, we're all together. The integrated delivery schedule uh, really has its roots in the yellow book. Uh, when the comprehensive Everglades restoration uh, uh, plan was approved in 1999, within that yellow book document, there was an implementation schedule. There were a series of Gantt charts, and uh, if you see our notes there, um, it was 30 to 40 years 
uh, at that time. And so uh, although it is going to take us a little longer to do that, I want to make sure that y'all remember that when you look at the IDS, we do have a nod to the yellow book components in there. And uh, subsequent to the yellow book, there was a requirement to do a master implementation sequencing plan. So what that means is we look at all the 68 components, we figure out how they fit together, we figure out when one should go before another, how long do they take, how much do they cost, and we put them together. But we knew that SERP needs foundation projects. Uh, it, is, it is not gonna meet its goals without standing on the shoulders of the projects that we discussed this morning already as well as some other very important state initiatives like restoration strategies. And so that is why we have an integrated delivery schedule. Uh, that's what you're looking at. And so real quick, I just want to make a nod. That picture was taken by our new Lieutenant Colonel Todd Polk at Everglades National Park when he was visiting. Uh, and I believe Pedro was there that day and Bob was there that day, if I'm correct. So just so you know, that picture was recently taken. So what is the integrated delivery schedule? Other than and the nod to the yellow book and, and where it has its roots, I want to make sure that all of you aren't thinking of it the way that I used to think of it, which is the end all and be all of everything related to the restoration program. It just can't fit on two, on two, page, on two pages of 11 by 17, even though we try. Uh, it is a looking forward document. It is what is coming next as we all come together to identify our priorities, and we are going to execute. So to Bob's point earlier, bring it on. This is us bringing it, right? This is our plan. Um, but it is a working version because there are so many of us with investments and, and, and building on that important momentum that I want to make sure that's why we have the SFER program overview placement as a companion document. There are, there's more to the program that is what, it, what is on the IDS. When we complete something, it comes off the IDS. I'm gonna show you how one example of that between the 18 and 19 versions. So looking forward, what are we gonna execute? What are we gonna design? What are we gonna plan? What are we gonna build? So just make sure that that's kind of, uh, as, you're, as you're looking at the documents, that's what you should be thinking about. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's pull out the 2018. So it's the one that has a, that, that black boundary all the way around it, the 19 one doesn't. To start, I uh, want to make sure I orient you uh, on, the, on the placemat, and if you pick the one, that, the side that has the actual Gantt chart, it is all color coded. And so the colors are going to transfer from the last year's to this year. So the blue a uh, bar that you see are our foundation projects, our non-cert projects. And I want to just show you that if you pick on the top line fiscal year 2020, as we saw it at that time, there was still, so if you look in the blue section, Tamiami Trail Next Steps Phase 1 was still on the IDS. You won't see that on the 19 IDS because we're done. So that was the topic of discussion, and that's what Bob's is so excited about. Yay! All right, so, so again, look for, looking forward document is what we're going to do, not what we have done, um, and, and that's what other documents are for. So just as an example, I want to make sure you know that the green are what we call our SERP Generation 1 projects. Um, we're going to carry that forward uh, to the next one, but they were authorized in WARDA of 2007. And so that's where we have Picayune Strand and IRL South. In the purple, we have the projects that were authorized, our Generation 2 projects for SERP that were authorized in 2014. Caloosahatchee uh, River Storage Reservoir projects. We have Broward County, Biscayne Bay, C-111 Spreader Canal Western. And then in the orange, we have Central Everglades. So the the if I'm... If I'm not mistaken, Kim, the first time we showed SEP on the IDS was 2018 in this level of detail. So the, the 19 is a big difference because we show all of SEP in the 19 uh, version that you have. So that's one of the largest differences between the one that we shared with you last year and this year. Want to make sure you just kind of get oriented. All right. That's all I'm going to talk about for 18, if I can... 
19, fiscal year 19 was a very busy year for all of us. And, and we have talked about a lot of these already. This is, this is just a, a snapshot of what occurred in fiscal year 19. And I wanna make sure that I highlight that our scientists published the system status report. That was a, an important document uh, that is a continuing dialogue and it looked at um, five years of data. And so if you have not taken a look at it, please do so. It is an excellent report. It has a lot of detail in it and I'm gonna show you the website to access it in just a moment. But I wanted to make sure that I highlighted um, that occurring in fiscal year 19. So one of the exciting things that occurred in 19 was the authorization by Congress of, if you look under PIRs, um, towards the bottom there, the South Florida Water Management District completed their Section 203 report, sent it to Congress, sent it to the ASA, and the ASA sent it to Congress, and that was uh, approved in October of last year in, in the WARDA. So that was one of the big exciting moments of, of fiscal year 19. The construction of the S333 North uh, was another one, um, and then all the ongoing construction that we have. C111 South Dade is one that I'd like to highlight because we reached a very important milestone in C111 South Dade, the federal project uh, in fiscal year 19. And, and what I'm highlighting between uh, Mod Waters, between the, the work that Bob talked about, between C111 South Dade, that is all the momentum that we are building on to be able to execute Central Everglades planning project. But it, it is on the shoulders of the foundation projects, it is on the shoulders of restoration strategies, and that is what is allowing us to um, see so much progress. Sorry, there's a delay in the slides when I hit the button, just bear with me. Okay, so, Last meeting, we had a great discussion. I wasn't here, but I was watching. We had a great discussion. Oh, man, I'm sorry. These buttons. Okay. We had a great discussion about the integrated delivery schedule, and including in that, in that meeting, our uh, science coordination group members requested to have input into uh, how the working versions and how the integrated delivery schedule gets updated. And we did that. We had um, um, some time with our science coordination group members that, that at that time showed interest in, in um, the integrated delivery schedule process. And we talked a lot about how to show how Everglades science is used by decision makers to put our funding in the right spot, right? To make those important decisions about where it is that we're gonna get that incremental benefit and so this is um, just a quick summary of, of how, that, how that occurred. Uh, that's what we did at the last meeting. We've had discussions subsequent to that leading up to today. And then in addition to that, we are hosting a public workshop this afternoon on the idea, so stay tuned. I think we've covered this today, so I'm, I'm not really gonna go into it too much other than the background is a picture of the bridge that I borrowed. And it does have the updated Tamiami Trail uh, Next Steps numbers that Bob talked about this morning. Thank you, Bob. And the updated numbers from the state of Florida budget. And then of course for us, uh, the very exciting $200 million in the president's budget. I have to say it's pretty awesome to join the Corps right when they get 200 million. <laughs> it's great, fantastic. It's been six weeks. Okay, so now let's talk about the working version. And, and it is important that, that we acknowledge that this is a working version because we, you're, you're kind of watching us work. You know, you're, you're seeing how we talk through all the different projects. And I would say that the, as, as has been discussed a lot today, the funding levels in fiscal year 20 were game changing. Um, it was, James mentioned it right before I came up. You see the difference from the earlier years to 2020. Um, so the theme for us, for 19, is building on historic momentum. Everglades science holds the key to achieving our SERP goals. And advancing construction 
and receiving ecosystem benefits from SEP as possible and achievable because we're standing on the shoulders of non-SERP and foundation projects that have reached important milestones in 2019. So if you can pull out the uh, 2019 version, we're gonna walk through 2020. So if you go to the first page and you find 2020 on the top, we're just gonna kinda walk down that column beginning with the blue section uh, in Mod Waters. So that's our way of showing that the combined operating plan, of which all of us have been working on and Bob talked about this morning, will be complete in 2020. That's why those little bubbles have, so if you look at the bottom, you'll see our legend and you'll be able to walk through with me. If it's black, it's a federal lead. If it's blue, it's the non-federal lead. And the little symbols are important because they tell you whether we're in operations, whether we're in design, or whether we're in construction. So at the very top, you notice that we have $456 million pending for fiscal year 20. As we walk down, we have Herbert Hoover Dyke still under construction, restoration strategies under construction, Tamiami Trail Next Steps is completing its design, as Bob mentioned this morning. Kissimmee River Restoration is under construction, C-111 South Dade operations, and then we have the South Dade, C-111 South Dade Packer, which Howie just mentioned uh, as our design work for replacing those two pump stations. Any questions so far? We're all together? Good. So green, um, you can, I, I, we added a few things this year uh, for ease of reference, and so if you look to the left, you see that bar with the, where the text is, is uh, rotated. You can find the word authorization for those. Um, and so as we continue down, we have Miller Pump Station, and so if you look at the little weird little uh, symbols, that means it's an operational testing and monitoring period. That's before we do the final operations, like we, it gets turned over. There's a period where we transition after we built it, where we learn lessons and we all work together. So it's important that y'all know that we do that together uh, between uh, the Fed and non-Fed, even if it's black. We do that together with our non-federal sponsor. So we have the Southwest flood protection features. That's design work. And then we've got road removal under construction for picking and strand. So one of the key messages uh, that I want to highlight is if you look at 2020, you see how we have advanced, if you compare the 2019 version to the 2020 version, how we have all advanced the IRL South projects not just the C44 reservoir, STA, and pump station, but the C23 and C24 north and south reservoirs and the stormwater treatment area. So that's one of the important changes. So moving on to the purple section, we've got the C43 West Basin Storage Reservoir under construction, C111 impoundment and design, Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands going to construction, Cutler Wetlands going to construction. And then uh, I'm gonna skip over set for just a moment and just uh, have a nod to the planning projects that Howie's gonna be discussing in, in the next uh, agenda item. And so before we turn the page, there's a new table on this working version. And it is a, a teeny tiny little table at the bottom right under our map. But every year that we look at the IDS, we get the question well, what have, you, what have you done, right? Because this is a forward-looking document. This doesn't encompass everything. What have you done? What, have your, what are your investments? Where are we, right, in the program? And so this is not a perfect table, but it is our first attempt at working together to show you our federal and non-federal investments that are credited. That does not mean that every investment is included in this little table. Because as, as Matt mentioned earlier, Northern Everglades and Estuaries Protection Program, which is incredibly important, is not on here. It's not creditable to the SFER. And so this shows you a snapshot of what's occurred. For example, Bob and I were talking the other night, I can't remember when it was Bob, but the important investments in land 
that Department of Interior has made in order to have the EAA reservoir be built, to have C43 be built. Those are some of the credited investments that are shown here for DOI. Okay. All right, so one of the things that people ask about a lot is where are you in the 50-50 cost share? There's a line item there, the one that says CNSF SERP. That's the actual current, or through 2018, excuse me, cost share when we talk about the ledger. That's where the numbers stood at the end of 2018, and there's a lot more to be credited for the non-federal sponsor, a lot of investments that have been made, and so we have a row that tries to capture that. But this is, again, a draft, and it's a snapshot in time. So we're gonna flip the page and look at uh, the Central Everglades Planning Project and also talk about incremental restoration and Everglades science. So if you look at the top bar, we have a couple of things, historic momentum, and so historic momentum ties into the incremental restoration section. We worked to develop a few statistics so that you get a sense of how much water is moving to the right places in the southern part of the system. This was the topic of discussion. Those two paragraphs that you see at the bottom of the page uh, was a topic of discussion when we met with the science coordination group members subsequent to the summer meeting. You know, how do you capture uh, something so large in such a small amount of real estate on a piece of paper? So this is our first try at that. If you have other thoughts or really cool graphics or any, anything else that you want to see, I'm all ears. Um, but this is kind of our working draft of, uh, of that. So again, Everglades Science, that's the link that I promised I'd show you to the uh, system status report and the Everglades report card. And then we've got some important benefits here that, that I want to make sure we highlight. For example, moving water from the western side to the eastern side of Everglades National Park that's captured in here. And so the very large orange part, which is Central Everglades Planning Project, it is the first time that we show you how the, all those projects fit together between SEP North, SEP South, and SEP New Water. And so I want to point to you that at the beginning of each of those SEP South or SEP North or SEP New Water sections, it kind of tells you a little bit in plain language what, why or what it means or what it's going to do. So SEP South, additional outlet structures needed to move more water south. And so as you look at each of those different components, you can see within SEP South that we are sharing the work with the South Florida Water Management District, the blue again, Old Tamiami Trail, S333N. And then what's in black we have uh, as the core completing. And so if, again, for 2020, one of the key messages, as you look down, the Water Management District is under construction. And for the two structures, now I'm going to, if you look at structure S631 and S633, so if you look down in 2020, you see that the core will be under design with a fourth quarter award. That's part of the president's budget that ties into what Howie just mentioned, that $70 million. A piece of that is there to go to a fourth quarter award for two structures that are shown on the inset map on the left. If you look towards the bottom, and I apologize that it's small, but if you look towards the bottom, you'll see that you have S630. If I orient you on the green bar, that is the L67A, we have, for example, the X, S631 and S633. Those are the two structures that we're advancing. So that's next year, awarding construction. And so uh, SEP North, big, big shout out to South Florida Water Management District, it's all blue. And so with the significant investments uh, that the state of Florida is making, the governor's initiative, a lot of those investments are being made in SEP North because we need SEP North to put to move water. When we're bringing new water in to the southern part of the system, you have improvements that we have to make in order to put it in the right place. 
and Water Conservation Area 3A. So that's why Step North is so important. So Step New Water is a combination of, of both agencies. And so we have the South Florida Water Management District uh, advancing the A2 stormwater treatment area that's part of the EAA reservoir project that was, uh, was, uh, went to Congress last year. And then you have the core uh, putting um, the EAA reservoir into its design process in fiscal year 20. And so I will point to you that we have, this shows you the implementation schedule that was approved in the packer and it is an ongoing discussion you know this is a working version this is all of us leaning forward with the eaa reservoir with sub north with sub south all of us working together to put all those pieces together but knowing that incremental restoration still has to be the fundamental principle of the day. And so without SEP North and without SEP South, SEP New Water doesn't work so well. And so with that, I'll take any questions. That's really what I wanted to make sure I covered. If I can get the slides to move. Oh, I'm sorry, I did have one more thing. I wanted to make sure you knew that uh, this is our going from working version to final uh, is what we propose to do in October at the task force meeting in DC on October 29th. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Ava. That was a, a very dense presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it definitely takes some time to go through and analyze that, but thank you for our, your team putting it all together. I'd like to recognize Colonel Reynolds for some comments. Yeah, so I just wanted to add a couple of, of things. Um, so the first thing you'll notice on the back side where it has the big orange block that outlines SEP, you'll see in one of the blocks under the S631 and S633 structure, we did show a transition of a line <clears throat> on that square where it goes from design to construction showing that we're moving from design into construction in that year. In all of the other projects, there may be places like on the front of the placemat where that actually may occur, but that's a really hard thing to do in the program that we use to make this document. Mm -hmm. And so um, because there's so much visibility on those structures in particular, we forced our folks to do that. We did not do that in other areas. So there may be other places um, across the integrated delivery schedule where that actually happens and that it, everything doesn't transition at a fiscal year break. So I just wanted to make that clear that there may be other places where we can actually start construction a little bit earlier or a couple months later into the next fiscal year that isn't totally represented um, just because of the technical limitations of the document. But that's where, as we talk about projects specifically, we can get into more specific details about those types of things. The other thing that I just wanted to point out is um, as everyone's getting over the initial sticker shock of the numbers um, on the IDS, I wanted to also reiterate that you'll see things like construction of the C23 and C24 reservoirs, for example, um, those numbers are not included in the IDS. Is that accurate? No, they're in there, ma'am. They are in there? Yep. Okay, so the, num the, the, the bottom line numbers at the top, and I'm looking at the front page of the IDS that has the blue, green, and purple on it. Um, when we look at some of the out years, those numbers would not include projects that are not authorized yet, for example. So, for example, the Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project and the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project that have not been authorized by WERDA, any construction that we may undertake in those out years, that would not be included in the bottom line numbers. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, and I realized that as I looked out at 
our Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands friends, I did not highlight the BBCW phase two or the second PIR. That is also one of the key messages. So thank you for mm -hmm. bringing that up because the funding for doing planning is in the number, but not any of the implementation yet. Okay, so I just wanted to help clarify because I know that there will be some questions about that and um, potentially some discussion items about what funding is included and what funding isn't included. And so Ava can aptly answer any of those additional ones, but I wanted to highlight those, those kind of differences as you're looking at what does this include and what does this not include. Thank you. Roland? Coming from a local government, I couldn't tell you enough how valuable having IDS is for addressing our citizens to tell, hey, what's going on? Every time a new solar bullet project comes along, we've got something. This is what's being done. This is the schedule. This is how. This is the roadmap, how we're going to get there. Also helps our board when we go into our state and federal legislative priorities. It gives us some documents to support for funding for these projects and authorization. But that being said, there's also a, we're very interested in the C43 water uh, uh, reservoir component. Uh, we're also interested in there's absolute there's a a movement to looking at a water quality piece to that. And I know it's not necessarily authorized as a SERP project, but perhaps there's a place in here that we could put that maybe as a non-SERP or just put it in there somewhere because it's not heavily funded yet, but it could be something down the road. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Ava, great job. A lot of great work went into this. And I know this was brought up at the task force meeting um, by, I believe it was Secretary Valenstein and also Mayor Wayne. And I was wondering, is there a way to really show on the IDS the consequence of, of the lack of federal or state funding and what happens to the, you know, to the schedule? You know, I think it would be really helpful to show that on the IDS. It's, a, it's, a, it's more transparent. I think people can you know, have a better idea and know what the consequences of not getting the state or federal funding instead of just, you know, coming out with a new, new IDS the next year or several years later where a project slips. For example, the C-43 reservoir slips another year based on the 2018 to the 2019 September version. And, you know, that's concerning. Um, and if there's a way we can advocate for funding both at the state and federal level, I think it'd be really helpful. So if you can't do it in the paper version, Perhaps there's a way, I know we talked offline about being able to do that electronically, and I know you can't commit Congress to funding, but I think it's important to be transparent and know what to expect and, and how long it's going to stretch SERP out if we don't get the funding we need. So thank you. Jennifer? Yes, I was going to say the very same things. I think that it's really important to note that the 2018 IDS had the C43 completed in 2022, and now the new one, the updated one, has it in 2023. Um, it'd be good to have an explanation as to why that is um, so that we can communicate that with our constituents, but also I agree with the idea that now that the C43 water quality treatment feasibility study is kicking off that we need some kind of placeholder or note because it is a future project that is in the pipeline and as you said this is a forward looking document so we want to make sure that people are aware of it and are being um, uh, able to prepare the funding resources that will be necessary to implement it. Thank you. Vice Chair. Yeah, one thing that <clears throat> just really strikes me is if you take the last year's and this year's and you look at the third line under, that's on the detailed schedules, I just line them up kind of looking at planning estimates, total construction cost. If you look, some of those numbers starting 2022 get really eye-opening. When the question about what, how are we, what are we, what can we do collectively to make sure we can try to achieve some of those funding levels when you go from, you know, if you look between 2020 and 2022, that's some big jumps. To, and for us to be successful, it's going to take a lot of effort to, to keep that going. I mean, just comparing that line between the two charts to me is really amazing. Thank you, Nick. Dave? It's kind of similar, thinking about putting this in perspective and, and how, the, I don't know how many versions of the IDS we, we've seen. And this, this is a, it's, it's great to see the update 
it's great to see detail on SEP in, in particular. Um, what I what I want to keep in mind is you know these are our, our engineering and fiscal projections, and uh, I'd I'd like to introduce reintroduce comment Bob made earlier about uh, addressing our constraints because the, the the flow of work, the progress is going to depend on our ability to to overcome some key constraints. Um, this does this does, and I think that's where the science coordination group in particular needs to be um, you know more focused on identifying those constraints and really uh, on trying to trying to overcome them and and you know water quality constraints with harmful algal blooms is a lot of attention and I have a lot of awareness of uh, um, Florida Bay and Florida Keys area and, but you know the whole west coast has issues so the restoration strategies effectiveness EA reservoir uh, um, treatment uh, associated with it, its effectiveness, that's really key. The seepage management, um, we're working on COP, you know, that's been, you know, a, a, a very, a positive struggle, I'll put it that way. You know, I think we have a positive outcome, but it's not, it's not an easy course. And a lot of us, you know, there's, it's, a, it's really an adaptive management approach that is needed to, to, to address those uncertainties. So that's, you know, there are more constraints, but I think we have to keep that in mind as we think about basically what our, our, our realistic expected uh, progress can be um, to really try to attack those <laughs> constraints in, a, a, in an effective manner so, and in real time with, with the engineering development. So that, that's just kind of a, not trying to be negative, but trying to be realistic. Thank you, Dave. And with that, what I'd like to do is invite, make sure we invite all of our working group and science coordination group members here at the table to join in at the public workshop that'll be happening in the room today at one. Um, agenda item, we'll move on to agenda item seven here, consultation on the project implementation reports for Lake Okeechobee water rest, Watershed Restoration Project, the Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project, and the Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project. This is a consultation. These will move on forward to the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force at the October meeting. Mm -hmm. Howie? Great. Thank you, Howie Gonzalez, again. And I'll, I'll jump right into these. Um, in the June meeting, I, I presented Loxahatchee, but, but just wanted to make sure it was uh, revisited today to be fresh in everyone's mind as we head towards the, that end of October task force meeting. But uh, I'll get to Loxahatchee in a moment. I'll start with the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project project implementation report, <clears throat> a study that we started back in the summer of, of 2016. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to get everyone up to speed on where we are with the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Project uh, and how we're progressing towards study completion. Just an overview for the Lake Okeechobee uh, Watershed Restoration Project. We're looking at the, the area north of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, looking at that loss of natural floodplain storage uh, that resulted in inflows into Lake Okeechobee that are six times greater than what can be released from the lake uh, and the challenges that that provides us. Uh, looking at also projects like Kissimmee River Restoration and how components of the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project will, will work in concert with that to, again, help change that timing of inflows to Lake Okeechobee, aiding in operational flexibility in the system. For the project area problems and, <clears throat> and objectives, uh, we're, look, we're looking at a, a big project area. It's approximately 920,000 acres. Uh, we say the size of Rhode Island, so a, a significant sized watershed that we looked at uh, or looking at during this pro just project implementation report. Uh, looking at storage north of Lake Okeechobee is a critical component of SERP, uh, again, to support the health and operations of Lake Okeechobee as well as the, the northern estuaries. It was envisioned that SERP storage features in the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project would be in connection to or connected to Lake Okeechobee and working with projects like Kissimmee River Restoration. Again, Kissimmee River as a foundation project looking to build upon that foundation to support restoration north of Lake Okeechobee. 
the study area includes four major drainage basins that you see identified in, in color there. So again, uh, looking at the different modeling and technical analyses uh, was, was a bit challenging on this study, but we feel our tentatively selected plan made best use of, of the tools available and helped identify a plan <clears throat> that we're moving forward with. And so through the planning process, uh, the tentatively selected plan is uh, alternative 1BWR. Uh, again, through multiple iterations and formulation, uh, going back to the drawing board in a couple of instances, you know, helped us land on this particular project. So, you know, after consideration of, of siting and analysis of project costs and benefits, we identified this tentatively selected plan in May of 2018. Uh, the tentatively selected plan includes the K05 wetland attenuation feature. Uh, it's in dark blue, which provides approximately 46,000 acre feet of above ground storage. And, and this is a shallow storage feature similar to other flow equalization basins we have throughout the system where the water depth is approximately four feet. It also includes 80 aquifer storage and recovery wells, 25 of which are co-located with the wetland attenuation feature. Uh, those are the yellow circles you see. And then, you know, ultimately 55 are located within a watershed along tributaries that drain to the lake. The TSP includes uh, about 5,000 acres of wetland restoration in a Paradise Run and Kissimmee River Center. Uh, and ultimately, we're looking at a plan that's approaching $2 billion. <clears throat> For the tentatively selected plan, uh, we, we had benefits, uh, we feel, throughout the northern part of that system, including the northern estuaries, Lake Okeechobee, uh, the wetland, direct wetland generation benefits, water supply benefits, uh, and, and not listed there, but acknowledging that there will definitely be recreation and ancillary water quality benefits. As we move through the study process, we have multiple opportunities to engage the project, both at the project delivery team level and through formal public review uh, and comment periods. Uh, we did get comments and letters of support for the draft report from the group you see in the box there. And the bottom portion of the slide shows, <clears throat> shows a summary of, of agency, tribal, and public comments, uh, both in its instances support of the storage, support of the aquifer storage and recovery, uh, and as is the case with some of our studies, you know, we have those who are actually in objection to some of those particular elements. Uh, ultimately, all feedback taken has been taken into consideration when, when formulating and selecting the, the tentatively selected plan. So where we stand in our schedule at this point is uh, we just completed a, a second public review period. Uh, we're consolidating all of that feedback and comments and, and it'll continue to, to update and modify the project implementation report as we work to build a, a f what we call a final draft that will work a uh, review process internally to the Corps of Engineers beginning in December. We have a, a final significant milestone touch point, uh, you see there coming up the senior leader panel. Uh, that's item number four on the chart as you progress across that smart planning process. That's scheduled for early February. Uh, and as we maintain our schedule, we'll have a final state and agency review in February with the chief's report in May. So again, a big push to complete this effort in time to have it available for consideration for a Water Resources Development Act of 2020 uh, as we're anticipating. So pending any questions, that concludes my consultation briefing on a Lake Okeechobee watershed restoration project. Howie, I have a question. Could you give me a little information about that senior leaders panel? Is that a core process internally? It is, it is. So that senior leaders panel are senior leaders at our, our headquarters USACE office, and so they're charged with looking across the enterprise at these types of studies to ensure that uh, the formulation that we conducted, the costs and benefits that we're identifying, and ultimately the support that we have from the non-federal sponsor uh, represents a project that we would ultimately want to recommend for congressional authorization. Thank you, that was very informative. Looking around the table, Seminole Tribe of Florida. Kevin? Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I'm new to this group. Um, I'm new in my position. But I'm not new to my understanding of where the Seminole Tribe um, currently views this project. 
And I just want to point out for everybody here in the room that the Seminole Tribe does not object to the project in terms of what its ultimate scope and objective uh, can do. They're not uh, at all uh, objectionable to having the ability to store water, to restore wetlands. Where the Seminole Tribe is objecting is to where the location of some of these features are, in particular the, um, the big reservoir on the outside of the Brighton Reservation, um, and some of the other scoping along with this particular project. And I just also want to note that um, Seminole Tribe has recently submitted, again, um, an objection to this project to the Army Corps. Um, so that going forward, I would just like the Army Corps to remember that, uh, and for all of those folks here, that uh, I think there's still some work to do on how this project ultimately gets designed and then ultimately executed. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds. Good morning. I really appreciate <clears throat> the tribe's comments on this, um, and we anticipated that you would um, make some. And so I wanted to <clears throat> provide some perspective of where we are in the process and sort of how this goes forward and some of the hurdles that we have with the bureaucracy of our process. Um, as we try and figure out how do we c collectively um, overcome hurdles like this in projects that we agree um, in general about the scope and the ultimate goals, but that there are specific components or um, ways of achieving those goals that maybe we don't agree on and that our bureaucratic processes are maybe a little bit clunky in order for us to really resolve those. So where we are with the locks, with the um, Lake Okeechobee watershed project is that if we don't turn in something um, for a chief's report to get to Congress in the spring, we won't make word of 2020. And that means that we would have to wait another two years to receive authorization from Congress in order to move forward. We don't have a mechanism in the Corps' process <clears throat> to make an adjustment to the current plan that would, I think, meet or work toward the, um, the additional information or the additional looks that the Seminole Tribe of Florida would like our teams collectively to consider. And so, you know, what are the options moving forward? <clears throat> I guess from, from my perspective, there's a couple of ways to move forward with this project that um, we could look for a non-concurrence from our senior, senior leaders panel on the project which would mean that we would either shelve the project or we would have to seek another authorization to have us completely relook the project. And something like that has happened with the Lake Okeechobee watershed project in the past, and it's also happened with the Loxahatchee project in the past, and we know that both of those projects have been delayed more than a decade um, because of that, because we got to a place um, in both of these projects previously where we had components of the project where people generally agree, uh, the wetland restoration component, for example. Um, and then we got to a place where there were components of the project like the storage reservoir where we didn't agree. And we couldn't move past that with the process. Um, so I think that that's an option and that's one way that we could see this project moving forward. Another option is that we, um, we look at sort of some way of reformulating the project. We don't currently have authorization or funding to do that. Um, I'm not sure and it's a little unclear what that process would look like, whether we would need, we would need some kind of approval from Congress in order to do that. 
um, and the mechanism for the core to seek that would generally not be supported um, by our agency because Congress has told us not to do that, to do a um, more simplified planning project and then come back to them with either a yes or a no that this project is feasible. Um, so that's where we're at the point where we're saying yes, the project is feasible, but not everybody is completely satisfied with all the components. Okay, so that's kind of that second off ramp. The third um, would be something that the core um, doesn't have a process to do, uh, which would be potentially um, for Congress to include in their word a language, um, additional language that would address the issues that we're seeing with specific components of projects like the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Project and also with the Loxahatchee Project. Um, we've seen that happen in the past with other projects. Um, we haven't really seen that happen um, recently with SERP projects. Um, and so it's something that is a possibility, but what that would look like is a little unclear. So it's hard for me to describe what that would look like. Um, but that's a third option, um, is that um, stakeholders like the Seminole Tribe that have specific components that are concerning could potentially um, advocate for language that would help Congress clarify their intent of authorizing a project maybe with considerations for other aspects um, or specific components of the project that need further study that they could then give us authorization potentially um, to do that further study for that specific component or to require us to come back to them with additional information or clarification on a component of a project before they would fully fund that aspect of the project. And that would allow us to move forward with the components that we agree on um, while uh, continuing to work on the other projects. Um, so those are just some options that we see, and I know the process is really clunky, but I wanted to try and describe that a little bit um, for the group as we move forward, because I think it's relevant for both the LACO project as well as the Loxahatchee project. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Reynolds. Stacy. Yeah, to, to, uh, to follow up on what uh, Kevin just said was, um, there are aspects of the project, uh, particularly ASR, with certain constraints that tribe would, ex would accept. But uh, we really question the feasibility of the WAF. If you don't know what WAF is, it's the reservoir portion. And that is due to um, you know, direct flooding impacts, potentially, to the, re to the reservation and uh, cultural resources uh, within the WAF that we have concerns about. So, we really question the feasibility period of that WAF. Uh, the ASR, with certain constraints, we feel that uh, that could potentially move on. And we've expressed that to the district and the governing board, and uh, to some degree they've agreed with us in that, in that position. So just wanted to make that last statement. Thank you. Any last round the table on Lake Okeechobee watershed? From there, Harry, we'll ask you to step into the Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project. Hmm. We'll do. Okay, so for Loxahatchee, another project that we started back in January of 2016, uh, we're looking at a, ultimately a, a completion date here in, in early 2020 and <clears throat> getting to the details uh, a little bit of the Loxahatchee project. So for purpose and location, again, as with most of our CERT projects, uh, we look at quantity, quality, timing, and distribution of, of freshwater flows. In this instance, uh, we're looking at that northwest fork of the Loxahatchee River, which has been designated uh, as a national wild and scenic river. So uh, a key element of our project is ensuring that we, we get the, the timing and distribution of flows uh, right for the, the Loxahatchee River and estuary. 
another big project area, in this case uh, about 480,000 acres, about 750 square miles, uh, multiple listed uh, species that we're working restoration projects to, to help ultimately support and a significant opportunity to reconnect and restore natural areas and the Loxahatchee River. So this project uh, ultimately contains three of the, the 68 SERP components. So again, a, another instance where we're successful in packaging the SERP components that came out of the, the original Yellow Book, our original Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, uh, into one specific project. <coughs> so for Getting the water right, uh, we identified alternative 5R as our recommended plan. Uh, the plan includes impoundments for water storage and improved timing of releases. Uh, the blue areas you see there would experience uh, restored hydrology. Wetland habitats would be restored and uh, green areas would not experience substantial hydrologic changes, but these areas would benefit more from, from connectivity uh, within this Loxahatchee watershed area. Um, the project was connected to the uh, original historic Everglades in the past, so we're, we're doing our best to try to restore that hydrology and hydraulics to keep water moving uh, through the Loxahatchee River and ultimately to the estuaries. From an environmental benefit standpoint, uh, we're looking at restored flows, restored wetlands, and improved habitat. Again, as we move through our project implementation report process, multiple opportunities to engage at that project delivery team level with formal public reviews, public feedback received, uh, support from similar groups that supported the, the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project, but support with concerns coming from some of the local water control districts uh, for, for similar reasons with regards to having an actual water storage feature uh, in, the, in the project area. From a schedule standpoint, uh, we're a little bit further along than the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project. Uh, we're looking at the senior leader panel for Loxahatchee to be conducted in December. Uh, we're in the final stages of review now as we're preparing that final draft report. And our expectation is that we'll have a chief's report in March 2020. Again, another project that'll go forward for consideration in the Water Resources Development Act of 2020. So. Uh, as we look at previous word is, uh, this one will be no different. We'll probably have no less than, than three to five items that will go forward to Congress for authorization. So with that, concludes my briefing pending any questions on Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project. Thank you, Howie. Questions? Yes, I'm sitting in the troublemaker's corner. Um, <laughs> No, th thank you uh, for recognizing accurately uh, Palm Beach County's position. We, just to make it clear, the county commission did not vote to voice their objection to the tentatively selected plan. So what they did do is approve a motion to continue efforts to support uh, Loxahatchee River watershed restoration, but also to communicate some key concerns, which, which Howie mentioned. And so we're working now with a technical cons consultant to uh, do some additional work that hopefully we can continue to collaborate with the core in the district, uh, whether that's um, on some of the forward paths that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds mentioned, whether it's language in a WERDA um, or language in a district letter of support. Uh, we're hoping to get some of that technical work available by the end of October. Um, and so again, thank you for uh, the update this afternoon or this morning. Looking around the table, last call on the Loxahatchee project. Howie, thank you very much. I believe both these, both these projects will be moving on to the task force as part of the consultation prize process. From here, I'd like to look around the table for a motion for our minutes to approve our minutes from the last meeting. Approved. We have a motion. We have a second on that. A second. All, all, all opposed to approve the minutes. Uh, all, <laughs> all in favor of approving the minutes? Mm -hmm. Aye. All opposed? Okay. We'd like to move into our public comment period. And we do have several cards here. Adam? 
Thank you. It's been a great meeting. A lot of uh, a lot of heavy information here and uh, so so forth. Moving on because we are on a schedule here. Um, first off, uh, first in the queue uh, uh, up to bat is uh, Irella Begay representing the uh, Greater Miami of Chamber of Commerce. And please keep your comments. We're trying to be out of here at a certain set time, but we do. Yeah. Where do I? Oh, sorry. Do we? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. And you can hear me. You probably can't see me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, as I'm, I'm also a member of the Biscayne Bay Re Regional Restoration Coordinating Team, representing the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce, and a former governing board member of the South Florida Water Management District, who voted to enter into a memorandum of, uh, of agreement in 2004 with the federal government to accelerate, accelerate the restoration and early design and construction of a group of restoration, Everglades restoration projects identified by the U.S. Congress as priorities, one of which was Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project in Miami-Dade County. Since then, I, along with many stakeholders, have continued advocating and urging for the completion of Phase 1 and the commencement of Phase 2 planning. And I'd like to thank the Army Corps of Engineers, particularly a shout-out to Howie, um, and the South Florida Water Management District, a shout out to Eva when you were here at the district, and now you're at the core, wherever you are, and also Matt Morrison for uh, agreeing and hearing us to engage in the development of the PMP and scope of study for phase two. As you know, as you know Biscayne Bay is an essential part of Miami-Dade's Miami economy, a large, and our prosperity comes from real estate, trade, tourism, fishing, all of which depend on a healthy bay ecosystem. In recent years, Biscayne Bay has been experiencing hypersalinity, seagrass die-off, coral reef disease, periods of algal blooms, red tide, and recurring sewage spills from our aging water infrastructure. Recent reports from NOAA and the convening of a grand jury by the Miami-Dade state attorney concluded that Biscayne Bay is in critical ecological decline, and its health may be irreversible if action is not taken quickly. Sustaining the momentum of the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project without adding elements that create delays is essential to achieving the restoration goals of Biscayne Bay and Biscayne National Park. Thank you again for the, pro pro the pro progress on this pro project. We're very happy, and I look forward to working with all of you to ensure that we can complete and help improve the health of Biscayne Bay for the 2.8 million people that rely on it. Thank you. Thank you, Arella. Uh, next up is uh, Joan Lawrence, and to help out with things, uh, representing self. Uh, after that is uh, Kara Cap. You don't know what to say if you're just a retiree. Uh, <laughs> Joan Lawrence, I'm a resident of Miami-Dade County and a member of its voting community and a former government. Uh, employee. This has been a great year for Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, and I'd just like to thank you all so much, in particular the Army Corps of Engineers of the South Florida Water Management District, with the same shout outs to Howie and to Matt and to Ava when she was with the district. Uh, we've moved forward with the scoping and project management plan for BBCW uh, Phase 2 project. I believe that utilizing the Biscayne Bay Regional Restoration Coordination Team, which is one of your teams, one of the working groups teams, as a forum has been successful and much appreciated by the stakeholders. Uh, as you all know, the 2019 Energy and Water Senate Appropriations Bill includes BBCW Phase II study language. It's gratified to see today in Howie's presentation that the President's FY 2020 budget includes $2.5 million for initiation and fully funding the Phase II PIR. We're on the right track now with BBCW, both in completing Phase I and moving forward with Phase II. Uh, the implementation needs to move forward without delay and is set forth in the IDS. Thank you all very much for your support for this very important project. 
Thank you, Joan. Uh, to reiterate what Joan was saying, the BBRCT is part of the alphabet soup that's Biscayne Bay Regional Restoration Coordination Team, uh, led by Carrie Beeler on the OERI staff. They've been very active. If you're interested in learning more about uh, Biscayne Bay related issues, uh, Howie's been very helpful. DEP has been very engaged at that level. Um, there's been a lot of activity over the last two or three months. So, BBRCT. Uh, Kara, thank you, from the uh, National Parks Conservation Association. Thank you, Adam. Um, thanks, everyone. Again, I'm Kara Cap for the National Parks Conservation Association. Always good to be in this room with so many um, friends and partners. We could not be more thrilled about progress on Tamimi Trail, so I just wanted to start there. Um, the success of that project is such a testament to the partnerships in this room from National Park Service planning, um, USDOT funding, state funding, FWC and the Water Management District really getting involved with old road removal. Um, it is just a, a huge effort, so I wanted to say thank you from our whole MPCA team. Um, we have been talking a lot at MPCA about being reservoir ready, meaning there was this huge groundswell of public support, and rightly so, for a storage reservoir south of the lake. But we know that relief for the northern estuaries is not going to come until we can send that water south, and under Tamiami Trail is the southern flow that we need. So thank you, Bob, and thank you all for your efforts. Um, of course, we share everyone's excitement about the funding levels for this year. Um, MPCA and many of our partner organizations that you regularly see at these type of meetings, we have long advocated for full SERP funding at the state and federal level. That's the role that the NGOs play, right? We go and meet with the appropriators, um, and we help make a compelling case to invest in the Everglades. Um, and the message now to our leaders is thank you and keep going. We can't have one good year of funding for the Everglades. Um, we see how much progress is made on the IDS with one um, inflow of 200 million. Imagine what we could do every year. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, our priority for using this funding is um, when we're updating the IDS, and I know we're gonna talk about it more this afternoon, is to finish projects to show progress and show what this level of investment buys so that the people who make these decisions want to continue to invest in our Everglades. Um, again, I know we're going to get into the details of the IDS workshop later, which I really look forward to because Eva did a great job um, going through those documents, but they're detailed and it's a lot to take in. Um, from our team's first look, it seemed as if there were a number of projects that with this inflow of money would be complete in terms of federal construction funding. Not that the projects are all done, but that the need for significant investment would largely be over. And of course, those include Kissimmee River, BBCW Phase 1, C-111 South Dade, um, C-44. And so again, not that these projects are done, but those projects represent a huge amount of that 200 million, almost half. And so to think that we are going to finish up most of the construction and then free up those dollars to focus on other projects moving forward is huge. Um, other projects like SEP South and like the reservoir, um, which are gonna be critical moving forward and are gonna be quite like, frankly very expensive. So we are finishing projects, we're freeing up those funds and then we're gonna be able to accelerate other projects more quickly. Um, I think the takeaway message is look at what full funding gets us. Um, imagine if we did this every year Again, I want to say thank you to everyone around the table and remind you that MPCA continues to be on your team and we're going to be here working for progress and for more funding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. Uh, next, uh, Doug Gaston from Florida Audubon and after that would be Lisa Interlandi with Everglades Law Center. Thank you, Doug. And thank you, Doug Gaston, Audubon, Florida. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the task force for this opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, and I also wanted to welcome uh, Lieutenant Colonel Polk to the party. Welcome aboard. Uh, I wanted to also thank Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds for her service, but I see she's left the room, but that'll be on the record. Um, I, would re I would reiterate uh, the things that uh, Kara just talked about uh, Everglades restoration has been a long and winding road, but it does feel like we're at a moment in time where uh, we'll be able to push a number of important projects over the finish line and begin to see the ecological benefits that these projects were uh, designed to deliver. Some of the presentations we've seen, which were really excellent, uh, show how close we are to some of these projects being completed and what we could expect once they are. 
Uh, so we encourage you to identify efficiencies to keep shaving time off of critical projects like the EAA re reservoir. Um, every project that gets completed with the current funds frees up funding to accelerate projects being planned now. So uh, we would encourage you to keep doing that so we can uh, try to find more ways to push water south. Uh, we expect that the next round of funding will allow the Corps and the district to shift these projects even further to left uh, on the IDS. Uh, and uh, as Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds said earlier, we are really excited about the funding commitments at both the federal and the state level. Uh, and so we hope that that will continue so we can keep pushing these critical projects forward. Uh, but that has to happen on an annual basis. So we're hopeful that that happens. So now's the time to double down, uh, keep pushing forward, uh, capitalize on the progress and the momentum that's being made, and um, try to keep pushing these projects forward so we can see the benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Ms. Interlandi, Everglades Law Center. Hey everyone, uh, glad to be here. Lisa Innerlandy with the Everglades Law Center. Um, I just wanted to say I really appreciate the comments by Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds about uh, the processes to try to get through uh, the Locks River and Lake O projects where there's still some outstanding concerns. Um, our organization and some others, um, as Jeremy mentioned from Palm Beach County, do have some concerns about the, particularly the reservoir portion of the Loxahatchee River project. You know, as it was stated about the other projects, we do support the project scope and the project goals. We absolutely want to see that project move forward, but we do need to find a way to build some flexibility into the approval so that we can uh, retain the ability to come to some agreement on uh, the portions of the project where there are still those outstanding concerns. So um, we look forward to continuing to work with you all to try to find that opportunity so that the project is not delayed, but goes forward um, with the utmost support from the community. So, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the public that's participating, watching from afar, and commenting today. Uh, for closing remarks, I'd like to turn to our check, check down the line here with our co chairs. Susan? No. It's a quiet, uh, quiet room today. <laughs> Adam? Again, thank you all for your uh, participation today. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, it may seem overwhelming, but uh, the OERI staff, again, is here to help you. Uh, they do a lot of the bulk work to pull you all together. Everything you're seeing here today, they do a great job, and that doesn't stop when it comes to these individual groups working on the, uh, the, uh, the priorities list and all the subgroups that are going on. They're dedicated to you all in the Everglades. Um, Moving on, the, uh, to remind everybody, the next task force meeting is on October 29th at the Main Interior Building in Washington, D.C. Um, sounds like there's a lot of momentum going to be moving up to Washington uh, from South Florida and Florida in general to Washington around that time period. Uh, my, my new supervisor, Assistant Secretary Wob Wallace of the uh, Fish and Wildlife and Parks uh, just started, but he is ready to engage this group and the process and the Everglades issues. Um, and so um, he's especially focused on the exotic invasive uh, strategic action framework, um, among other items. Um, the next joint working group SCG meeting that we have planned is December 5th. Uh, we have framed out uh, the next year of tentative schedules. If you need to locate that, reach out to one of us and we'll get that to you. Uh, I appreciate everybody for uh, very productive and uh, James for keeping us on time kind of we're coming in we're coming in close so thank you everyone for attending and thank you for participating in the work you did to get us to this meeting I do have some housekeeping remarks we do have a task force workshop in this room at 1 p.m. so I'd like to ask that as we clear the room we do it efficiently and we take our personal belongings today so the room can be reconfigured by our by the the folks at the water management district and OERI when you come back in, there'll be tables set up, and our folks from the Working Group and Science Coordination Group would like to ask that you make sure we, we leave room for the public at the tables, 
and let the public grab seats at the table. So everyone does have a seat at the table, which sticks with our sticks with the way we've operated the working group and uh, task force workshops in the past. So thank you all very much, and have a great afternoon. Hmm?